Hello everyone, and welcome to Proxima's Ani What Ifs. What Ifs, so we are back with an interesting movie on what if Naruto was a god with power of Sage of the Sixth Path. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. In the time of the Sage of the Six Paths, there was more than just more going in the world than the birth of Ninja. It was also around this time that magic came to be, leading to the birth of Magi. No one is quite certain just how or where exactly magic first got its start though over time through meticulous study, it would be revealed that strange alien stones had something to do with this. Merging with certain people prior to them ever awakening as a magus, but the number of people who could use it grew slowly over time and usually kept their powerful abilities hidden from the rest of the world, not wanting to attract the attention of the shinobi, whose culture was flourishing following the sage of the six paths, Hagoromo Atsutsuki, defeating the monstrous Yubi, the god tree. And spreading the art of ninjutsu across the countries. However, one day this all changed. A group that called itself Aluspa, which was dedicated to researching the unearthly stones, was found out by a small number of shinobi, and these shinobi, upon discovering the existence of Magi, attacked Veluspa in an attempt to take the stones they had and try to use them to make themselves stronger. Members of Veluspa fought back, but unfortunately their abilities, strange in the eyes of shinobi, earned them far more attention than they ever would have preferred, and soon more and more shinobi would show up to try and take them down. In the end, a small war erupted between Magi and Shinobi, this war kept secret from the rest of the world. This miraculous secrecy was due to Veluspa who eventually managed to create a machine that generates a dimension known as I-Space, where Magi could fight against Shinobi that had managed to take and merge with the stones, thereby becoming Magi themselves upon awakening. All the while, the people that were not fighting on the front lines tried to think of ways to put an end to all of the fighting and restore order to the world before things escalated anymore. To this end, the most brilliant and dedicated scientists of Veluspa did their best to try and replicate a stone, which was nearly pitch black in color and odd in shape upon creation. This stone was created with the intention of whoever it merged with would become the ultimate magus, one with the power to finally put an end to the war. However, much like the original stones, this man-made stone would only fuse with a person who was born with latent magical abilities that lied dormant deep within themselves. And in this case, and this case alone, the stone would only bond with the strongest of them all. After many failed attempts, Veluspa would finally find the only person that the stone had deemed worthy of merging with, a member of their own group, much to their bitter irony, after having spent months on end of searching outside of the organization. This member was a man that had a certain air about him, one that radiated absolute confidence and power, and commanded respect from everyone around him, despite not being a shinobi nor a warrior in general at the time. Veluspa and other Magi had rejoiced following the merging of this man and the Black Stone, thinking that soon their battle with the shinobi would be brought to an end so that they can return to secrecy. But, much to the shock of everyone, including the man himself, he could not awaken as a Magus. No matter how much he trained, no matter how many battlefields he fought on, no matter how many people he ended up defeating, he did not awaken his innate Magus abilities. Before he amongst Magi had given way to resentment over time, and soon the man was seen as a sort of outcast, a failure. Despite how strong he grew even without awakening, he simply was not powerful enough to end the war. And so the war continued. But one day, this had changed. One shinobi who had merged with a stone stolen for Veluspa, awoke as a magus, and his abilities had proven to be terrifyingly powerful. Quickly becoming drunk on his own power, the newly awakened magus had gone on a rampage, during this time managing to destroy the machine that generated ice space, and as a result the dimension collapsed. The fighting between Veluspa and the shinobi turned Magi spilled over to the real world, where the insane shinobi that had now been labeled as the rogue flame would proceed to slaughter them all, laying waste to everything around him in maddening glee. It was at some time during his rampage that he had stumbled across a small village that by sheer chance the man who had bonded with the pitch black stone lived. The man, who along with the rest of Veluspa had not foreseen the rogue flame's attack, had only watched in horror and helplessness as he returned to his home village in time to see it burning, the flames rising high into the sky and flickering malevolently, like a scene directly out of the pits of hell. The man had searched whatever had remained intact of the village, desperate to save anyone, but to no avail. Everyone that had been in the village at the time of the attack had been killed. The only survivors were those who had been out of the village at the time. Despair had struck the man as he eventually stumbled across the charred corpse of his wife. This shock, combined with everything that had led up to this horrific sight, was enough for the man to finally awaken as a magus. Immediately following his awakening, the man hunted down the rogue flame and killed him, and then proceeded to put an end to the war, before it was even night that very same day, his abilities proving to be above and beyond anything any other magus has ever known. 
but despite his victory and the return to secrecy for Magi, it had been the most bitter irony for the man, in order for him to have awakened as a magus to protect what he held dear, he first had to lose it all. The man, overcome with bitterness, would then disappear from the world with a new goal in his mind. It was a goal that he vowed he would see accomplished. No matter what it may take. Many many decades later. I got it. A young girl, seven years old, exclaimed happily. Said girl was of slightly below average height for her age and had long red hair and bright blue eyes, which she had inherited from her mother and father respectively. She was Ryaiko Yuzumaki Namikas, daughter of Minato Namikas and Kashina Yuzumaki Namikas. Her father, the esteemed Yellow Flash himself, stood nearby with a proud smile on his face. Great job, Ryaiko. He said proudly as he looked over the damage done to the log they had used for Ryaiko to practice a low-level wind jutsu on. Ashina was nearby as well and was all but squealing for her daughter's success. You'll be a great Kinoichi in no time, she said, with a big smile on her face. From his room in the family's pleasant two-storied house, Naruto Namikas, elder twin brother of Ryaiko, watched the rest of his family interacting from through the window. Unlike his sister, who mainly took after their mother with the exception of the eyes and skin complexion, Naruto took almost completely after Minato, with the only real difference being their skin complexion. Whereas Minato had a skin complexion that was almost more along the lines of a tan, Naruto had the light, almost pale complexion of his mother. And unlike his sister, Naruto was of slightly above average height for his age. The elder Namika's child sighed tiredly. There they go again. He muttered with a hint of disdain in his voice. It's always been this way, for as long as he could remember. This was because of what happened nearly seven years ago, when the two of them had been born. The powerful Biju, the Kaiubi, had attacked the village on that very same day, and Minato had gone off to fight the beast, only to be incapable of actually defeating it. With the impossibility of actually defeating the Kaiubi, Minato was only able to turn to one option. Sealing it, which is exactly what he did, sealing the strongest of all the Biju into Ryaiko, turning her into a Jinchuriki. Amazingly, Minato didn't die as a result of the sealing, as the Reaper Death Seal was supposed to kill the user, only for said creature to decide holding off on taking Minato's soul for the time being apparently. It had been following this that she was proclaimed a hero by the village when Minato revealed what he did to the populace. Ever since then, Ryaiko has been treated like gold, while Naruto had simply been pushed off to the side. Even his own parents paid more attention to his sister over the years than they ever have to him. At first, this had greatly angered him and caused him great despair. But as of now, at only seven years of age, Naruto had simply stopped to feel any real connection with his family, as his parents were always busy attending to Ryaiko outside of their own duties Minato as Hokage and Kashina as an occasional instructor for new Anbu recruits, while paying him less and less mind. Though every now and then, he'd feel a smidgen of anger whenever he saw scenes like this. And they've never said just how the Kaiubi got loose anyway, he thought as he got up from his current sitting spot. He and Ryaiko were both aware of the fact that their mother had been the previous Jinchuriki for the Kaiubi. While Ryaiko didn't really seem to pay this little fact any mind, Naruto did, wondering just how in the hell the Kaiubi got free in the first place then. Naturally, this was a question his parents never bothered to answer. Putting his shoes on, Naruto ran a hand through his spiky hair as he then walked out of his room, down the stairs, and decided to leave for a bit. It's been a few days since he's seen his friends anyway. Heading out for a bit, he said loud enough for his parents and sister to hear. He received no reply. This got a twitch out of him, though his facial expression seemed unreadable. He slammed the door on his way out. Naruto walked with hands in pocket through the village as he made his way to where he and his two friends mainly hung out, that being one of the training fields, one that was the furthest away from the village. As he took his time walking to the training field, not a single villager or shinobi he passed by so much as even glanced at him. Even though he was the eldest child of the Hokage, he meant very little in the eyes of others, being virtually unknown as everyone paid far more attention to his outgoing and energetic sister. Naruto walked in silence, in turn not paying the rest of the crowd any heed at the moment. It took him a while to get there, but about 20 minutes of walking later, he finally arrived. As luck would have it, he was not the only one there. Naruto, said the only other person, a boy around the same age as Naruto. He was of average height for his age and was of a lean and wiry build for a kid. His somewhat shaggy black hair framed his face a bit, the boy's matching black eyes locking onto Naruto. He smiled. How are you doing? Naruto smiled too. Doing good, Ryuchi. You? He replied as he walked forward, his eyes unconsciously looking over the training field like always. The training field he and his friends favored was pretty plain, with a flat grassland look to it, though there were several boulders surrounding the large field in a circular pattern. But there was one thing that made the training field stand out, and it was this that Naruto's eyes locked onto. 
Right there, on the opposite end of the training field from where Naruto was at, stood a large and beautiful Sakura tree, its petals practically glowing in the sunlight. Wordlessly, Naruto walked up to it and pressed his right hand against it and closed his eyes. Ryuchi watched this in silence, having grown used to this, it was a habit that Naruto had developed when they first started coming to this training field. Naruto sighed in contentment as a moment later he finally took a step back. He wasn't sure just why this Sakura tree was even here in the village at all, as it contrasted with the other trees that were in the general area, but he wasn't complaining. For reasons he just couldn't explain, there was just something about this tree that put him at peace whenever he came. I'm doing well too, by the way, Ryuchi said in amusement. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, having already forgotten he had just asked how Ryuchi had been doing too. Ah, my bad. Ryuchi just laughed and got off the boulder he had been sitting on and began to approach Naruto. He began to clench and unclench his right hand. Well, since all we've been doing lately is either just hanging out or training on our own, how about we have a quick spar? It's been a while since we've done that, he stated. Naruto smirked. Whenever it came to conversation, things always did appear a little awkward between the two of them, just like now with how they've barely said anything to one another for the past few minutes since arriving. But then again, the two of them never really won for verbal communication. Instead, they communicated with one another through another way. Naruto chuckled as he took up a fighting stance, one that was based off of the standard stance taught by the academy, though with his own spin on it. Sounds good to me. Bring it, Ryuchi. Ryuchi grinned and took up a fighting stance as well. As soon as he did so, he let out a bit of a battle cry as he then charged straight at Naruto, surprisingly fast for one so young. But Naruto wasn't taken off guard by the speed and so was able to tilt his head back in time to dodge the punch that Ryuchi promptly tossed his way. Ryuchi wasn't done just yet though, letting the momentum of the punch spin him about to execute a roundhouse kick that Naruto had to actually leap back to avoid. Then Naruto took advantage of the opening left after it to rush forward and deliver an uppercut at Ryuchi's exposed torso, only for his friend to raise his right arm to guard against the hit. Naruto threw a few more punches after that, one aimed for Ryuchi's face, while the others were aimed for his lower torso, but Ryuchi, despite being a kid, dodged them all with a finesse that would have looked more at home on a seasoned chunin. Naruto couldn't help but grin a bit, and the same went for Ryuchi. Both of them were unusually talented in tojutsu for kids so young as shown when the two of them began to start trading more blows right now, with the two being nearly even, though Ryuchi was beginning to gain an advantage, and Naruto found himself slowly getting forced back as he started to attack less and defend more. Dodging and blocking the many punches and kicks that Ryuchi was throwing at him. It got to the point where Naruto had no choice but to roll out of the way as Ryuchi leapt a bit to do a fierce reverse roundhouse, the kick just barely missing Naruto. As he rolled underneath the airborne Ryuchi, Naruto managed to reach out and grab him by the leg and pull down. Ryuchi could only yelp in surprise before he crashed into the ground. Naruto then charged at him, but this was rewarded with Ryuchi quickly recovering and kicking him hard in the chest with both feet. Naruto gasped, losing air as he staggered back and fell, though he rolled to end up on his knees rather than on his back. He did this just in time to see Ryuchi leap to his feet, and Naruto spotted an opening as he did so. Shrugging off the pain as best as he could, he ran forward at Ryuchi. His friend saw this coming and threw a haymaker, but Naruto had in turn seen this coming too and moved low, spinning about and smashing an elbow right into Ryuchi's side. Ryuchi's eyes nearly bulged out of their sockets from the strong and well-placed hit and he stumbled back, clutching the winded area. Naruto dashed forward a few steps and punched Ryuchi again in the midsection, nearly making him double over. Naruto blinked in surprise right after that as Ryuchi appeared to double over too much. Then surprise gave way to shock when Ryuchi somersaulted forward. OCR he began only to get cut off as the back of Ryuchi's right shoe smashed into his face. Naruto was knocked back at a bit of an awkward angle, as though he did a backflip and failed at it. He groaned. Oh. He said, clutching his nose, which was now bleeding a bit. That's my line, Ryuchi coughed out as he slowly got up. He wheezed as he rubbed the spots where he got hit. He then made his way over to Naruto and offered him his hand, which Naruto took and stood up. You alright. Naruto grinned despite the pain. A, I'll heal. Times like these make me glad I'm an Uzumaki, strong vitality and all that. He paused as he began to wipe the dirt off his clothes. You've gotten better. Ryuchi smiled a little cheekily, a bit of surprise as he was usually not the playful type. So have you. Amazing what training can do for us if we really give it our all. Naruto nodded as he finished wiping off the dirt. Yeah. That and it's because of that scary bushy brows guy. He and Ryuchi shivered at that as they recalled the first time they met Mido Guy, nearly a year ago or so when they had first met and started to train. The green jumpsuit wearing man had been passing by at the time of them training one time and lent them a hand in their physical and tojutsu training, 
having been touched by their youth, i.e. the surprising intensity in which the two had put forth in their training at that time. Every now and then, Kanoha's green beast would seek them out to see how things were progressing with their training. While his help was much appreciated, the two boys could go without the man's terrifyingly large eyebrows and obsession with youth. Why yeah? Ryuchi muttered. He and Naruto respected the man greatly, but damn it if he wasn't an odd one. Oh, you two are already here. A young girl's voice called out to them. Both boys turned to see a young girl, just a few months younger than them, entering the training field. Said girl was of average height for her age, with a skin complexion almost matching Naruto's. The girl had long light brown hair currently tied back into a ponytail and light blue eyes. Currently, the girl was dressed in plain clothing, the kind one wouldn't have a problem with getting dirty. In her right hand, she carried a wooden sword. Mickey, hey there, Naruto said with a smile as he waved to his other only friend. Ryuchi waved too, but didn't say anything, simply opting for a cheerful smile. Mickey simply looked at the two and took note of Naruto's nose, which was still bleeding. She also didn't miss the disheveled look of the clothes both boys wore. She simply giggled as she walked towards them. Already sparred, huh? Both boys looked sheepish. Yeah, you know it. Shame you weren't here, you'd have seen me have Ryuchi on the ropes, Naruto bragged. Ryuchi shook his head and smacked Naruto lightly on the back. Odd. That's not how I remember it just a moment ago. Maybe I hit you too hard. He said. The child of the Hokage rolled his eyes. As if. At this point, Mickey had gotten close enough to the boys for her to pull a small cloth out of her pocket and use it to wipe Naruto's nose, which took said boy by surprise. And Mickey. She smiled a bit ruefully. You did know you still had a bloody nose, right? She wiped up the blood and then tossed the cloth onto one of the boulders. She made a mental note to wash the cloth later or something. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Ah, my bad. He glared at Ryuchi right after that as he heard the other boy chuckle. Ryuchi stepped forward a bit, eyeing Mickey's wooden sword. How goes the kenjutsu training? He asked. At that, Mickey sighed. Not too bad, but it'd be nice if I can pick up the training pace a bit more, too san and ka san fret too much. She looked a little bummed, but there was a bit of understanding in her looks too. After all, it wouldn't do for someone so young to practice with deadly weapons. Ryuchi nodded in agreement, his eyes closed and arms crossed. Then he opened his eyes. In that case, care for a spar. I'm curious to see how good your technique is now. Mickey smirked and nodded. Ryuchi smirked in return and then looked at Naruto. How about it, Naruto? You want to spar again too? Naruto waved him off as he started to walk towards one of the boulders. Sure. After you guys are done though. The last time all three of us fought at the same time, things got a little too out of hand, even for me at the time. His friends wordlessly agreed with that and thus proceeded to get to their spar. Both Mickey and Ryuchi took several steps away from each other, Ryuchi taking up his earlier fighting stance, while Mickey raised her sword at an angle in front of her. Both of them had a steely look in their eyes, a stark contrast to the semi-serious and mostly playful look that Naruto and Ryuchi had during their spars. The reason behind this was simple enough. Both Mickey and Ryuchi were essentially mortal enemies when it came to sparring. In Mickey's case, since she was so young and all she's focused on was kenjutsu so far in her short life, her tojutsu skills were horrible, and if she ended up with her wooden sword knocked out of her hands, then she has essentially lost as she wouldn't be able to go against Ryuchi's far superior tojutsu. In Ryuchi's case, while he held the tojutsu advantage, Mickey had the range advantage due to the size and length of her wooden sword. And her skill with it was praiseworthy for one barely starting out in kenjutsu, so that just made her all the more dangerous. But what he was always worried about when sparring with her was her philosophy of kenjutsu being a deadly art meant to defeat the opponent as swiftly as possible. Because of this philosophy of hers, Mickey always goes for what could be deemed the ending blow, not holding anything back. And while this philosophy turned training may not leave her with too much stamina since she always tried to end things swiftly, Mickey's strength was surprisingly great, being just a few notches below him and Naruto, so a direct hit from her is going to hurt a lot, to the point where he'll be wishing he had Naruto's constitution afterwards. It was a bit funny in a way, Mickey took sparring so seriously because of her own surprising philosophy and the belief that not ending it quickly could lead to defeat, whereas Ryuchi took things so seriously because of Mickey never holding back and in turn always unconsciously not holding anything back either, leading to Mickey being on the offensive more to keep him from disarming her and so on. It was really one big circle in a way. Naruto sat down on one of the boulders, shifting around a bit as it felt rather unbalanced, like it might roll out of place if he moved too much. It was as he did this that his friend started their spar. As Ryuchi expected, Mickey immediately rushed forward, wooden sword held high over her. With a yell, she swung down fast enough that Ryuchi only barely managed a step back to avoid it. 
The young boy then moved a bit to his right and jabbed at Mickey, but she raised her sword in time to guard against it, Ryuchi's fist smashing harmlessly into the wooden object. Undeterred by this, Ryuchi went low and performed a leg sweep, but Mickey lightly jumped to avoid it and swung her sword at an angle. Ryuchi had ducked to avoid the swing and rolled back after his failed attack, trying to put some space in between him and Mickey. But his female friend gave chase. Despite how serious he takes this, Ryuchi couldn't help but chuckle very briefly. Always on the offensive, he thought. Mickey spun around, arms extended as far as she can manage as she swung. It was once again dodged by Ryuchi, and the boy retaliated against this with a high kick aimed for Mickey's chest. Just like he had done, Mickey dodged, but only barely as she had to use the back of the wooden sword to slightly deflect the kick in the process. She then moved forward a bit and tried to smash the bottom of her sword hilt into Ryuchi's side, but he actually caught her arms before she could do anything and pushed her back. Mickey stumbled and it was at this sight that Ryuchi actually decided to really go on the attack and he charged right at her, jumping and attempting to kick her in the chest. Mickey saw it coming and managed to regain her balance in time to jump a bit and as Ryuchi's kick passed right by her, both of them lashed out, cross-countering one another. Mickey had swung her wooden sword and the flat side of it slammed into Ryuchi's side, while Ryuchi had managed to swivel his upper body, enough to throw a punch that had hit Mickey in the left side of the face. Both of them cried out in pain and surprise from the cross counter and ended up getting knocked back, with Mickey falling onto her butt, while Ryuchi, who had still been slightly airborne when hit, hit the ground a little awkwardly and ended up rolling across the ground a bit. Naruto, having watched the brief spar in silence until now, was surprised and worried now. Those hits had looked rather nasty. You guys our, whoa. He began to say as he quickly began to move off of the boulder, but the sudden movement caused the boulder to roll backwards and he ended up falling forward on his face. Naruto quickly began to get up, a little embarrassed as the fall had only slightly stung. Just awesome he muttered sarcastically. As he stood, he immediately dusted himself off and moved quickly towards the downed Ryuchi and Mickey. You alright? He asked as he helped Ryuchi up and then Mickey. Ow, ow, ow Ryuchi muttered as he held his side. That was a pretty good hit. I can say the same thing. Mickey quietly said as she rubbed the quickly forming bruise on her face. She paused in her actions to look at Naruto. How about you? I just saw you fall. Naruto rubbed the back of his head, averting her gaze. So damn embarrassing. Ryuchi managed to shrug off the pain he was feeling just long enough to pat Naruto on the shoulder. It happens to the best of us, he said with a chuckle, only to stop almost immediately and go back to clutching his side. Naruto just twitched at his words. Read. Of course, he said blandly before turning around. He froze right after he did though, his eyes locking onto where the rolled boulder had once been. He then raised a finger and pointed. Uh, guys. Ryuchi and Mickey both looked at where he was pointing and blinked rapidly in surprise. Right where the rolled over boulder used to be and sat what looked like three stones. All three stones were very unnatural looking to say the least about them, unearthly even. One was roughly half the size of Naruto's hand and it was a brilliant blue, more beautiful than the color of the ocean itself. The other stone right next to it was a bit more jagged around the edges and roughly the same in size and was a startlingly vibrant yellow, bordering on gold. The last was just a bit larger than the other two and was much thinner, being a glowing white in color. All three kids could only stare in shock and amazement. Say, Ryuchi. Mickey. Have those always been there? Naruto asked dumbly. Both of them shook their head. And no, we would have known if they were. Right. Mickey replied uncertainly, her grip on her wooden sword slackening by the second. Well it's not as if we've ever looked underneath the boulders here before. Ryuchi brought up as he took a step forward and stopped. All three of them shared a look before they began to walk towards the stones a minute later. When they reached the stones, all they could do was keep staring. So should we tell someone about these stones? Ryuchi asked his friends. T there could be a chance that these belong to someone. No way, everyone in the village would be talking about these things if they belonged to someone, Mickey said, shaking her head. Naruto didn't say anything. Instead, a few seconds later, he slowly crouched down and began to reach for one of the stones. W what are you doing, Naruto Mickey exclaimed in shock. He looked at her briefly. Just going to touch it. He sounded a little worried though. And before you say it could be dangerous, just think. What else do we do? Just leave them here or something. He asked. Mickey, who was about to speak, closed her mouth quickly and began to think on that. It was true to an extent. There wasn't really anyone that they could tell about this since they didn't know what they would tell them. And after having seen these stones, leaving them here just wasn't an option, after all, what if someone else came along or something? If the stones are dangerous then letting someone else potentially get hurt was out of the question. Ryuchi seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Mickey too, his eyes narrowing. Then it can't be helped. 
If these things are dangerous in any way, then we can't just risk someone else coming along and get hurt by touching them. I'd rather take the trisk myself, he said surprisingly sternly. He's always had a rather strong sense of justice in a way. But that said, Naruto nodded in agreement and then focused his gaze back on the stones, more specifically the blue one. He slowly reached out for it, keenly aware of his friend's worried gazes drilling into the back of his head. Then his index finer made contact with the stone, and he froze for an instant to see if anything would happen. When nothing did, he let out a breath he didn't know he had been holding. Well, so far nothing. Ryuchi and Miki seemed a bit relieved by this, but still pretty worried. Still, I can't just let you take this risk then without any more talk, he reached down and grabbed the yellow stone. I, I guess I'll take the last one then. Miki said before she quickly grabbed the remaining stone, the white one from its spot on the ground. When they did this, Naruto fully took the blue one into his hands and stood back up. They all stared at their held stones keenly. It doesn't feel dangerous. Naruto spoke up. Then it appeared as though he spoke too soon as the blue stone in his hand suddenly began to glow, nearly blinding Naruto for a second. Whoa. Before he could even think to drop it, he saw the blue stone, then float out of his hand and shoot straight into his chest. He staggered back, not from pain but surprise as the stone went through his skin like a ghost through a wall. When that happened, he felt a strange feeling overcome him for a brief second, one that nearly made his entire body go numb solely from the shock of it. He fell onto his butt, his eyes wide. Naruto. Both of his friends cried out. But before they could do anything, the same thing ended up happening to them, the stones they held floating out of their hands and blasting forth into their chests. They fell to the ground just like Naruto did as the strange feeling overcame them. However, as fast as it had happened, the odd feeling disappeared, and now all three kids simply sat dumbstruck on their rears, trying to figure out what just happened. Hey are you guys alright? Ryuchi asked a few minutes later, all of them still trying to get their bearings. Why yeah, I think so, Mickey replied shakily. Naruto rubbed his chest at where the stone had seemingly entered him. As same here he slowly began to get up, his legs shaking a bit. Damn, just what was that? Don't know Ryuchi said as Naruto helped Mickey up. Mickey shot Naruto a grateful look for helping her up before she began to rub her chest just like Naruto had done. Well, it doesn't. Seem. Feel like something bad will happen she said quietly. Only time will tell, I guess. Naruto said uncertainly. Ryuchi looked around the training field warily before looking at his friends. Hey at any rate, how about we call it an early day and head back home. And if something comes up with any of us about this, we let each other know as soon as possible. He suggested. Both Naruto and Mickey nodded. Yeah, sounds good Naruto replied. Same here. Mickey also answered. Then, awkwardly, all three of them began to head home, their thoughts caught up on what had just happened. Naruto in particular was worried over what had happened. He wasn't sure why, but he had a feeling that what had just happened would came back to bite them all in the ass one day. Ten years later. Naruto sighed as he stretched his arms. Ha. He did his best to suppress a yawn as he walked through the village towards the training grounds. Over the years, the son of the Hokage has grown up quite a bit, with his hair being much spikier than it was as a kid, in addition to being in a bit of a different style, drawing attention to his baby fat free face. The 17-year-old has also grown to be a bit on the tall side, standing at just an inch taller than his dad. And thanks to all of the tojutsu training he does, he possessed a lean yet muscular physique, somewhat shown off by the simple light shade of black pants and matching shirt he wore. Over the shirt, Naruto wore a thin black vest that was unbuttoned and was a few shades darker than the rest of his clothes. His standard shinobi sandals was also of a similar shade of gray, the clothes too'd wear complementing the vest. To complete the look, Naruto also wore an immaculate silver necklace in the form of a howling wolf head, a present he had received a few years back for his birthday from Mickey. Right now, Naruto was planning to simply hang out for a bit on his own, his sister and parents still being in bed, it was rather early in the morning after all, and as such as he walked, there were very few villagers around. This was something that Naruto, as sleepy as he still was, liked. Aside from his two friends, he was not exactly much of a people person. That'd be Ryaiko. He thought a little bitterly. Over the years, his parents' lack of attention for him had remained the same while they and just about everyone else in the village, mainly focused on Ryaiko, and as such the younger twin of the two Namika's children, was far more sociable than Naruto was. What's more is that in addition to getting all of their parents and the village's attention and support, Ryaiko was turning out to be a splendid Kanoichi of Kanoha, with her now on a genin team, with none other than the talented Sasuke Chiha and Sakura Hurano, who has shown a talent for Jinjutsu during their time in the academy. As for Ryaiko herself, she had received training personally from her parents, while Naruto hand. She was decent at tojutsu and had a large arsenal of jutsu in regards to ninjutsu, though she mainly stuck to a few jutsu in particular. 
while she may be lacking in Jinjutsu due to how much chakra she has as a result of being a Jinchuriki, she also had some praiseworthy skill with a sword, courtesy of training with Kishina, who once used a blade back when she was younger. But in Naruto's case, it was far different. While well, he was extremely talented in Tajutsu, aside from Gai's tutelage every now and then, he had no one else to help him improve aside from Ryuchi. The number of jutsu he actually knew outside of the basic ones taught at the academy was dismal to say the least, and thanks to his Uzumaki and Namika's lineage, his chakra reserves were too large for him to even think of using Jinjutsu. All in all, as usual, it seemed he got the short end of the stick as just a few days ago, his and Riaiko's godfather Jiraiya came by and discussed with Minato and Kishina the possibility of Riaiko signing the Toad contract. As always, she gets everything without even trying, Naruto thought as he violently shoved his hands into his pockets. Over the years, he had gone from being relatively calm in regards to the neglect he suffered at the hands of his parents and everyone else to nearly hating them all for it. The only reason he didn't actually hate them was because at least he knew it wasn't intentional, merely ignorance on their part, though that only made it worse in a way. But nonetheless, he was far from happy whenever he was around his family. He continued to walk in silence until he got to the training field that he and his friends had always hung out at, that being training field 13. His frown slowly turned upside down as the Sakura tree bloomed as beautifully as always, as he was close enough to actually see it. Like always, just approaching the tree had a calming effect on the blonde teen, and his slowly forming smile gave off a sense of inner peace as he finally approached and gently placed his palm on the trunk of it. Even after all this time, I still don't know why I'm calm down around you he muttered to the tree, not caring that it wasn't actually alive or anything, but I'm not complaining about it. He stayed like that for a few minutes before backing away and jumping onto one of the boulders in the area. As he did so, Naruto couldn't help but look at one boulder in particular, the one that he, Ryuchi, and Miki had found those odd stones under a decade ago. Every now and then he'd think back on that day, but only thought on it idly. It wasn't as if he'd figure out what exactly had happened that day after all. Naruto sighed. Man, what a nice day so far. He looked up at the sky as he got his mind off of the memory. The eldest child of the Hokage proceeded to stay in that position for several minutes in peace. However, that peace was shattered and done so by the one person Naruto hadn't expected at all. Having sensed this person's presence and recognizing it, Naruto got off of the boulder, his contented smile turning into a deep frown. He looked towards one of the nearby trees. What is it? This was all he demanded and nothing else. If anyone had heard how he said these three words, they would have cringed at the level of barely controlled anger that made itself known in his voice. From the tree, some rustling could be heard before someone dropped down from one of the branches a few seconds later. It was a girl of slightly below average height for a 17-year-old girl, but as if to compensate for her short stature, the girl had a reasonably curvaceous and well-endowed figure, somewhat shown off by the red jacket, the mesh shirt under it, and the plain black pants she wore. On the right pant leg was a kunai holder, firmly strapped there. The girl's complexion had slightly more color to it than Naruto's own, which perfectly matched her red hair and bright blue eyes. It was none other than Riaiko, Naruto's younger twin sister, all grown up and so far shaping up to be a beautiful and strong Kanoichi. The girl was looking rather sheepish at having been caught, shown in the form of her almost nervously scratching the back of her head. Hey, he he, you sensed me, Ani chan she said. Riaiko. Naruto's voice was cold as he addressed his sister. His sister flinched. What? Is. It. He demanded as he put his hands in his pockets. Riaiko fidgeted, like a young child being scolded by her parents. Er, nothing, she began. It's just. Well, I happened to wake up early and spotted you leaving. So I was curious to see where you were going. She tried to sound confident, but failed. So you essentially stalked me? Naruto asked, his patience wearing thin. Granted, he never really had much patience for things regarding his family, especially his sister sometimes, but it was particularly short right now and in his mind, it was justified, his sister was a very curious person by nature, and sometimes had a bad habit of snooping into other people's business, if it really caught her interest. Thankfully, she had never really tried to do so with him and his friends, to the point where she pretty much steered clear of them, but it seemed like today Riaiko had decided to break away from her usual thing. Combined with Naruto's already poor mood prior to coming here and right now the elder twin was feeling quite angered over this. Riaiko pouted, averting his gaze. Well, I wouldn't put it like that. She then looked back at him. But, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to hang out for a bit. Is that okay, Ani-chan? Her pout went away, and now she looked at her elder brother with hope in her eyes. Despite all of the attention and privileges she had received growing up, Riaiko was far from arrogant and was quite thankful for everything her parents and everyone else had ever done so far. 
As a result of all the love and attention, she had grown up to be a very lively and energetic girl, making many friends that were around her age, and was usually hanging out with at least several of them whenever she wasn't training or spending time with her parents. Indeed, she was a very happy girl who was satisfied with how her life has been going so far. But. It was just one thing, or rather one person, that had her worried for some time now. And that was her brother. For as long as she could remember, Naruto never hung out with her or anyone she knew. He was rarely, if ever, seen around the house by her or their parents, and on the few occasions he has seen and interacted with them, conversations were short and very much to the point. The same thing occurred with him and the villagers and other shinobi as well, with Naruto moving about without a care, while everyone else didn't seem to notice him. And it was this that worried Ryaiko so much. It was as if her brother was a ghost in some way, moving from place to place silently and without notice. It was only the fact that she knew he had two friends that kept her from fully believing her brother to be a genuine loner. Nonetheless, Ryaiko loved her brother dearly and truly wished to be able to be close with him and do things that brothers and sisters would normally do, but getting his attention was far from easy as he usually was doing one thing while she had to do another thing amongst other such circumstances. That and the few times she actually could interact with him were not exactly ideal. Such as now when he gave his answer. No. Naruto's voice was firm and seemed to leave no room for argument. It's not okay, Ryaiko. Not one damn bit. The look of hope in Ryaiko's eyes was extinguished, but despite this, she tried to talk back anyway. B but, why? Is it really that wrong to just hang out? She looked ready to cry. All previous attempts to spend some time with her brother had ended in failure, with Naruto being quite blunt in his replies, and now all that failure was getting to her. I wouldn't say it's wrong, but it's not fine, Naruto retorted as his pocketed hands clenched tightly into fists. Especially since I think I told you one time for you to stay out of my business. This training field was perhaps the only place where he could truly be at peace and relax, aside from being with his friends. His sister's continued presence here was just continually grating his nerves. Ryaiko's head lowered and her shoulders slumped as the anger in Naruto's voice all but literally pierced right through her. B but. Naruto then removed his right hand from his pocket and pointed towards the village. Go. He said nothing more and didn't have to, the underlying anger said it all as it is. Ryaiko's head lower in shame and sadness even more. Oh okay. She whispered before slowly turning and proceeding to walk away. Naruto waited and watched until she was well out of sight a few minutes later. Damn. He sighed as his anger slowly seeped away. Taking a few deep breaths and exhaling slowly, Naruto managed to fully calm down and ran a hand through his hair. Maybe, I shouldn't have been so cold with her. He thought a few minutes later as he recalled how sad his sister had looked just as she left. He didn't really mean to be so angry with her, but usually whenever he saw his sister, all he could think of is all of the neglect he suffered so far in life, and the fact that it wasn't until relatively recently that his sister began to take notice of him and try to hang out with him wasn't exactly helping. If anything, it sort of rubbed him the wrong as it took her just this long to really notice him. Naruto then walked up to the Sakura tree and placed his hand on it again in an effort to calm down. It took a minute or two longer than it usually did, but Naruto was once again placated. Maybe coming out wasn't such a good idea though he thought. He had never imagined that Ryaiko would follow him to what was essentially his haven of a sort, but now that this has happened, he felt as though something had been violated in a way, and it gave him a sense of unease despite his returned calmness. However, he was snapped out of his thoughts when he once again detected someone approaching the training field. He smiled softly this time around, the person coming was welcome, unlike Ryaiko. Naruto turned to greet the new arrival. Mickey, he called out to his friend. Morning, Naruto-kun, she greeted as she appeared, the young woman greeted as she kept on walking. Like Naruto, Mickey had certainly grown up since she was young. She was of average height for a girl her age, but was startlingly curvaceous and well-endowed, beating out some mature women in the bus department, with all of this packed onto a very slender frame. However, Mickey was also quite muscularly well-built, just like the Hachiyubo master from history's strongest disciple Kinichi, possessing strong and well-toned arms and legs, due to all of the time she spends training with swords, especially large and heavy ones, much to the surprise of many of her classmates back in the academy. Her very fit and attractive figure, however, was somewhat hidden by her current wear, consisting of a simple easy-to-move-in black skirt and a plain lightly colored long sleeve shirt. Over that she wore a black apron that matched her shinobi sandals in color. She had also grown out her hair a bit so that it was just a bit past her shoulders, framing her cute face, with a few bangs actually almost spiking downwards to cover up her right eye a bit. She smiled beautifully as she approached Naruto. Still addressing me like that Naruto muttered, a little amused. He wasn't sure why, but one day a few years back, Mickey had stopped addressing him simply by his name and had started to add the kun suffix whenever she spoke his name. 
One time he had asked Ryuchi if he knew why Mickey had started doing that, but all he got in response from his friend had been a shaking of the head in exasperation at the time. What are you doing up so early? I figured you and Ryuchi would be sleeping in. Dusan was up early, and he figured that I might as well help him deliver a thing or two, Mickey replied as she then hefted a long thin package that Naruto hadn't immediately noticed before. He blinked in surprise. Let me guess. A sword. He asked. Mickey nodded. Yeah. He just finished this one up a few days ago, but forgot to deliver it to the one who commissioned it. So now I'm the one that has to do it. She pouted as she said that. Naruto chuckled a bit. Mickey's father was a blacksmith for shinobi weapons, with swords being his specialty. Ever since she was young, Mickey would help him now and then, doing small errands like this. It went a long way towards explaining why she's always been fascinated with swords. Mickey looked at the package and then at Naruto. Want to come with me? It'll just be a quick drop off since I think the person who ordered this is still in bed. Sure. Naruto smiled wholeheartedly as he said this. However, the smile dropped when Mickey's face turned slightly red. Err, Mickey. You alright? Hey, ah, it's fine, she said, suddenly a little shy. Let's go. She turned around hastily and started to walk. The eldest child of the Hokage, a little confused, followed after her like a lost puppy. Easily catching up with his only female friend, Naruto and Mickey proceeded to quietly walk back to the village and remained quiet until they were about halfway through said village. Wow, just where does this guy live? We've already passed by a few residential areas, Naruto pointed out. I only know his address. I've never really been near the area he lives in, so I can't really say much on that, Mickey replied sheepishly. Both fell silent for a few minutes after that. Say, Mickey then said a minute later, I saw your sister when I was walking to the training field. Ah. Naruto nearly growled, though not out of anger. You did, huh? He shifted slightly as he walked, a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I could have sworn she looked ready to cry, Mickey commented. Having been looking forward the hole as she walked, she finally craned her head to look at Naruto. Did something happen? Naruto nearly flinched under her concerned and questioning gaze. Sort of. A pause. She followed me to the training field and tried to hide from me in a tree, he said abruptly, then when I called her out, she tried to talk me into hanging out with her, but I sent her away. The way seemed to rush saying those words only told Mickey just how much of an effect that she, his close friend, can have on him for him to so suddenly spill out what had happened. I see, Mickey replied, a bit taken aback by how sudden his reply had been. She tried to think of something say, but could only come up with this. Sounds like you were pretty cold with her. Her words did little to cheer him up. In fact, it did the opposite. Naruto hung his head in shame. I know he sighed. I know it's not her fault or anything for all the shit I put up with, but she shouldn't just be following me around to places. Especially not our training ground. Mickey did smile a little. I know. And you have a right to be angry over this, but I think you're being too hard on her. I mean, she is at least trying to get to know you a bit better. Right. She sounded unsure. She and Ryuchi have done their best over the years to try and give Naruto a shoulder to lean on, but there were times where they felt it was best for Naruto to try and reach out to his family and pray that his family would take notice of what they've unintentionally done and do likewise. So Ryuko's attempts to connect with Naruto had their value in a way, even if the girl seemed to have this bad knack for moving in on Naruto's territory. And Naruto was very territorial sometimes. Naruto scratched the back of his head. I guess. Ah, I don't know. With how she operates, I question if she's really serious. He fell silent and so did Mickey, the girl unable to think of anything more to say. Both of them walked in silence the rest of the way to the place they were to deliver the sword to. It took about several minutes of slightly sped up walking to get there, but finally they did. This customer sure lives in an odd place Naruto muttered, having grown uncomfortable with the silence. Mickey silently agreed, whoever had commissioned the crafting of the sword lived in a part of the village that was well away from any residential areas and was instead more geared to commerce and trade. Maybe he works as a trader or something on the side. Mickey spoke up as she gently placed the sword by the door to the home. It was still a bit too early in the morning for anyone to really be up, so there were very few people around, and thus Mickey wasn't too worried that someone would try to steal the sword, only Shinobi bought swords, and no civilian in his right mind would try to take it from Shinobi after all the waiting for the new weapon. Maybe Naruto agreed. Though he wouldn't say it aloud, he was beginning to get an odd feeling. It was as if there was something off about this place. He doubted that whoever paid for this sword to be made was actually asleep at the moment. Say, Mickey, Naruto then said with that in mind, just what kind of sword did this guy exactly ask for? He questioned as it occurred to him that perhaps there was also something to the sword. As she turned away from the door and started to walk away from the oddly placed house, she answered Naruto. Ah, it was nothing really special. Just a standard Nadachi. 
A pause. But it was kind of odd. Naruto raised an eyebrow in interest. Odd in what way? He asked. He had requested for the tip of the blade to be blunt. But what's really odd is the material he wanted it made out of. Mickey drifted off in thought for a few seconds. I can't remember what the name of the metal was, but it was extremely rare. So rare, in fact, it took Tucson a few months to track down someone who actually had it in stock. Apparently, the customer had wanted this metal because of some special trait to it. The special trait. Naruto looked confused. However, rather than tell him, Mickey simply looked resigned. I don't know either, he didn't bother telling Tucson what exactly he meant by that. Then she sighed and smiled. Well, at least that's taken care of. Now maybe I can go back home and sleep for a few more hours, it's way too early for me to be up. She stretched her arms as she said this. Naruto just shook his head, a smile slowly appearing on his face. Right. Well, in that case, how about I walk you back home, eh? Mickey's face turned slightly red again, making Naruto confused. Mickey. His friend suddenly faced away from him. Eh ah, it's nothing. Okay. Naruto didn't sound too sure himself when he said that one word. Nonetheless, his confusion aside, he did indeed walk her home, the two of them chatting a bit on when exactly they should meet up to do some training, since today was an off day for them. After all, he, Mickey, and Ryuchi were all one team. It took a bit of time to plan things out, but eventually, they had decided to simply train on their own for about three or four days, before having a group training session. Eventually, they had arrived outside of Mickey's house, in the form of a large two-story building, the lower story serving as a weapons shop, while Mickey and her family lived on the second story. I'll pass this info on to Ryuchi later, I guess, Naruto said as he and Mickey stopped in front of the entrance to the shop. Sounds good to me. Then Mickey smiled. I wonder how the next spar between you two will go. What do you mean by that? Of course I'm going to win. Naruto proclaimed confidently. Mickey giggled as she knew that he didn't actually mean it. Despite all of the training both Naruto and Ryuchi had undergone since they were young, despite how often they spar, there has yet to be an actual winner, all of their spars would end in a double knockout or a simple stalemate, with neither able to land the deciding blow on the other. But then again, it wasn't as if the two of them were going all out with the intent of killing each other or anything. Right, Mickey said, though there was a slight teasing undertone to it. Sure, you'll win. Hey, don't doubt me. Naruto pretended to pout. Mickey stifled a bit of a laugh. I never did, Naruto-kun. I never did. Naruto chuckled a bit too. I know. He smiled, a true smile, one that he doubted he'll ever show around his so-called family. I think it's time I head in, Naruto-kun. Before my parents actually get up, Mickey said a few seconds later after they had their little exchange. Right. Naruto took a few steps away from Mickey, his eyes not leaving her. Some things aside, that was a pretty nice morning walk. We should do that again sometime. Mickey. Definitely. Naruto's smile grew slightly wider before he turned around and began to walk off, giving Mickey a two-finger salute in the process, a gesture that Mickey returned in the form of a simple wave. Mickey waited until Naruto was well out of sight before she decided to head inside. However, it was at that moment that something very much unexpected happened. The sound of a water drop suddenly rang out across the area, yet it was only audible to Mickey and no one else. Eh? That was all she was able to utter when a brilliant flash of light appeared, nearly blinding her because of how unexpected it was. But as fast as it came, the blinding light disappeared, and so Mickey was now witness to a shocking sight. W what? All around her, Kanoha no longer existed. Instead, it was simply a vast open space, devoid of anything. No buildings, no mountains or forest, no life. There didn't even appear to be a ground beneath her feet, giving her the impression that she was literally walking on space itself. Mickey, having never encountered anything like this before, responded to this by naturally looking very shocked and even a little scared, as this was definitely not a jinjutsu from the feel of it, which in turn meant that nothing she could do will break her out of it. W what is? She began to stutter out as she looked all around her for a way out. She stopped her search before she could finish her sentence, leaping back suddenly when several figures, entirely shrouded in shadow appeared as well. What? She thought as her right hand immediately moved to her side on instinct, intent on grabbing a sword to use, only to not find one. She swore under her breath at that. What the hell? One of the shadowy figures, from the sound of the voice, a man, bellowed. What's this? It was clear that from the sound of his voice, he too was very much shocked by whatever was happening. Mickey stiffened a bit as she had nearly reacted once again to the man's sudden bellow, but then began to try and calm herself, upon noting that from the barely visible body language of the other shadowy figures, that they too were in the exact same position as her. Boy. The same shadowy figure spoke up. The fuck is going on? He demanded of the others, Mickey included. When he got no immediate reply, he got angry. 
Hey. Cal. I'm talking to you. Mickey glared at him. I don't know. Why are you asking me anyway? She shot back. You little bi he started. Well, you guys are certainly loud. Annoyingly so, a new voice said, one that belonged to none of the other figures. In one synchronized motion, all of them turned to see that someone else had shown up too. And unlike them, he was not hidden by shadows, giving them all a good look at him. The arrival was young, no older than maybe 13, and was clearly a boy. He was a bit shorter than what would be expected of his age, and possessed a thin physique shown off by the slightly baggy grey pants he wore, in addition to a simple light blue shirt and black jacket over it, so he couldn't possibly be a shinobi of any kind. Despite this, the boy's childish face, framed by shaggy golden blonde hair, had a very confident even arrogant smile on his face. His steel grey eyes looked at them all as though they were nothing but bugs. The kid. The man from earlier spoke, disbelief evident in his voice. The fuck. Is this some kind of game? He growled out in growing anger. The boy laughed haughtily, an action that made everyone there feel quite uncomfortable and not particularly eager to get to know him. A game. Heh. The boy said. Everyone could practically feel the boy's bad intentions at this point. His existence was beginning to grate them all right now and he's only been here for not even a minute. What's so funny about this, boy? The man demanded. Ah, nothing much, oaf. The man bristled but was ignored. It's just that game is a fitting word to use right now. He took a few steps towards them all. And it is with that said I now invite you all to this game. Ha. Ah, Mickey said. She could feel the others shifting in their spots too in silence at what the boy just said. The boy stood up a bit straighter as he placed his hands in his pockets. A smug grin appeared on his face. You five are but five out of twelve people selected by a god to compete for a god's power. The boy's smug grin grew wider as he saw through their body language the shock of everyone there. If you win this game then the power that you'll obtain will be nothing short of immense. Anything will be possible for you, even immortality, he looked at one of the shadowy figures as he said that and then looked at the man from earlier. And even the ability to resurrect someone without any drawbacks. Mickey openly gaped at the boy, though she doubted anyone could see her do so, if she was right, then just as these people had their identities hidden from her, then it worked vice versa as well. T that's impossible. You're just making this up. The boy snorted. Believe what you will, but it doesn't affect the reality before you. I'm simply the messenger who has come to announce the start of this game. I believe it would be best if you would be a bit more detailed, one of the shadowy figures said, a female from the sound of the voice and a young one at that too, possibly around the same age as Mickey from what the girl could tell. The boy glanced her way. Fine then, I suppose. He removed his hands from his pockets and spread his arms far apart, as though to welcome someone into his arms. This world is where the participants that being, us shall fight as a part of Ragnarok. This is the world made by the ultimate Magus, codenamed Odin. And it was Odin who gave me the position of messenger and game master for this game, and as a result, I can make a few changes to this world I space whenever I want. And for now, all I did was simply remove it a bit more than it usually is from the rest of the world, he explained. Magus. Another one of the unknown figures said, another man. The boy sneered at him. Ah, you don't even know that much. Very well, I'll enlighten you a bit. Mickey couldn't see the man's face, but she had the distinct feeling that he was very much angry over how this kid was acting. At some point in your lives, you all came across a sort of stones, stones that have never really been seen before, he began. Mickey flinched at that as suddenly she found herself thinking back on something years ago. He doesn't mean. She thought. And these stones merged with you. The reason why they did is quite simple. They are designed to do so with certain people. Certain people who are born with innate magical abilities. He looked them all over before continuing. People. Just. Like. Us. He smiled as he let the word sink in for them all. You see, people like us, who are born with these innate powers, are known as Magi. However. We are unable to unlock our magical abilities on our own, for unknown reasons. But when these stones merge with us, they interact with our innate magical abilities, so that when a time comes when we experience a moment of great trauma or are in a situation that would require a powerful will on our part, the stone will awaken our magical abilities, which will take on the form of a magical weapon. The boy looked back at the man who asked the question. And I'm sure you can guess the rest from there, he said. Magical weapon? Mickey asked tentatively. The boy then looked at her and leered. What? You've awakened as a magus quite some time ago, and yet you still don't know what it's called. How stupid are you? He taunted. Mickey's eyebrow twitched in annoyance, both at being taunted like this and at the fact that this boy knew about that particular fact. Indeed, Mickey was a magus, having awakened her magical weapon a little more than a year ago. It had been during a mission with her team, her fellow Jen and Naruto and Ryuchi. It had been a simple enough mission. 
to go and take down a bandit group that had been threatening a nearby village. At one point during the takedown, the three of them had gotten separated and she was very nearly killed by several bandits. However, she had utterly refused to go down without a fight and it was her strong resolve at the time against the surprisingly strong bandits that had awoken her magical weapon and she had been able to defeat them, thankfully without using her, at the time, new weapon. Having been shocked and a tad bit frightened by the sudden change, she had kept this a secret from her two friends even until today. And yet, despite the lengths she went to in order to avoid having her magical abilities known, this boy had appeared to know all along. The boy chuckled. In case you are wondering about how I know, it's really quite simple. With my magical weapon, there is nothing that I can't possibly know or do. After all, it is my right as the true king to know all. Coo coo coo, a king you say? The shadowy figure who had asked about the term Mega said. You are no king, little boy. Not in the slightest. The boy glanced at the man and sneered, though there was a bit of an edge to it this time around. If that is really what you think, then I won't try and change your mind. A king doesn't have to prove anything to anyone. Then he looked them all over. Now then, with that out of the way, I suppose it's time to actually explain the rules of this game a bit. After all, there is another matter that I have to deal with right after this. He closed his eyes for a moment before opening them a few seconds later, the sneer gone in favor of a small, almost gleeful smirk. The rules are quite simple really. At my choosing, I space shall be invoked, and it is here that we Magi will fight. It doesn't matter how the battles go, it could be one against one or two against one, etc. All that matters is that one Magus must have his or her magical weapon destroyed within 13 hours of I space being invoked. The destruction of the magical weapon will mark the Magus's defeat. 13 hours, the girl from earlier spoke up. For there to be such a time constraint implies something will happen if time runs out. What happens if no Magus is defeated within that time frame? She questioned almost emotionlessly. Mickey couldn't help but shiver slightly at how calm this girl was despite all that was going on. It was downright unnerving at how she just seemed to accept everything. If no one is defeated after 13 hours, then I space, which encompasses all of the major hidden villages and every minor one in between them all, shall expand until it engulfs the entire world. And once that happens, everything that could be defined as alive will cease to exist. The boy grinned coldly as he said this. Mickey was shocked, even horrified by this. What? Why would you do something like that? She demanded. All she got in response was a shrug. I didn't make up these rules. Auden did. He simply shrugged again. Moving on, there are just a few things for you all to be informed of. Firstly, he began and snickered, I should tell you all that as I'm sure you're well aware of now, is that as a result of awakening as Magi, we've all become extraordinarily hard to kill. We could be skinned alive and end up growing back all of our skin after nearly an entire day. We even have noticeably extended lifespans, on top of slower aging. It wouldn't be too much of stretch to say that we are immortal in some respects. However, Despite our own formidable immortality for lack of a better word, we can still be killed. Through the destruction of our own magical weapons, the boy said, now no longer playful or arrogant, but almost grim. If our magical weapons are destroyed, then we shall not simply die, but cease to exist entirely. We will be wiped clean from the memories of anyone we've ever met, and any physical records of us will up and vanish too. For us, it will be as if history itself had forgotten us, as if we never even existed. At that, Mickey grew horrified, more so than she already was. Her legs began to quiver slightly, her mind desperately trying to wrap itself around all of this. However, what the boy had just said was definitely not lost on her. If these rules really were as ironclad as he hints they are, then the only way to prevent the destruction of all life on Earth was to fight and defeat another Magus here in ice space. But in order to defeat a Magus, his or her magical weapon would have to be destroyed, in turn wiping that Magus out of existence entirely. It was too cruel a fate, one that she wouldn't wish even on her own most hated enemy. But if time ran out in ice space and no one was subjected to such a cruel fate, then it was the end of all life. But the boy was not done just yet. And as it just so happens to be, only a magical weapon can destroy another magical weapon, though there are some exceptions, he said as he looked up as if in thought. Then he looked back at all of them, who were now so still out of shock. A small smile found its way onto his face now. Well, I suppose it's better than simply dying and leaving others to carry the load, he said, shrugging dismissively. However, his voice carried something else to it that no one there could identify. And lastly, whenever a Magus is defeated, that person's magical power will absorb by the one who defeated him or her, thereby increasing the winner's mana reserves, the boy finally finished. Are there any more questions, plebeians? When he received no reply, either because they were all simply too shocked or horrified to speak up, or simply because they really had no questions, the boy smiled and nodded to himself. Very well then. 
Well, it has been a bit of a bother to actually tell you all of this, but I suppose it couldn't have been helped, I am the game master after all. He put his left hand in the jacket's left pocket while he raised his right arm straight up. It's time for me to return you all back to the real world. Have fun squirming about until we fight because whichever one of you is unlucky enough to fight me will definitely not be winning, he said haughtily. W wait. Mickey yelled after finding her voice. The boy looked at her, annoyed, but she didn't care one bit. You said that there were 12 people chosen for this this. Horrific game. What about them? What if they haven't awakened as Magi yet or been informed of this? The young game master chuckled. Not my problem. Besides, them not knowing about any of this will only make things much more entertaining when I start the game for real, don't you think? Mickey's eyes widened in absolute shock, only to then narrow. Her fists clenched tightly as she felt this powerful urge to hurt this kid, but she couldn't do anything about it, there was no ground for her to try and run across to get him. You. I don't know who you think you are, but you're already beyond forgiving. The boy's eyebrow twitched. Beyond forgiving. Me. Beyond your forgiving. You're forgetting your place, you big booped cow. I am the king and you are just an insect, he retorted angrily. Oh yeah, then how about you prove it? All you've done so far is just talk and gloat. Mickey shot back. She knew that she most likely shouldn't antagonize him, especially since she had no idea what he really was capable of in addition to the drawback of her own magical weapon, but she couldn't help it, she was pissed. The boy was silent for a minute, while the shadowy figures simply watched in silence, one of them feeling rather amused by this. I am Take Heiko. Wakahisa Take Heiko. Remember my name, you wench, for perhaps one day, we really will see who is the supreme one. He then addressed everyone else. Until then, plebeians. Try not to use your magical weapon outside of eye space, the last thing I feel like putting up with is the attention of all those pathetic shinobi on us. And then he snapped the fingers of his raised right hand, and the blinding light from before appeared once more. A second later, the light faded and Mickey blinked, stupefied. She was back in front of her home. She whirled around, cautiously looking to see if perhaps there was a surprise lying in wait for her. When there wasn't, Mickey sighed slightly in relief, but her mind was still very much chaotic from all that had just been said by that take Heiko kid. She gulped as a bit of sweat formed on her forehead. Her hands clenched tightly into fists, so much so that her arms shook almost violently. But she eventually managed to calm down a minute or two later, taking deep breaths to clear her mind, closing her eyes in the process as well. And when she opened them up once more, there was a look of complete determination in her eyes, such that even the most powerful of Jonan would be frozen to the spot if they had spotted this. She had resolved herself, no matter what happened, she wasn't going to let this ritual or whatever it really was hurt anyone else. Even if she had to fight her way through eleven other people, she would not let this ritual do anyone else harm. On this, she swore that she will do her best to survive and win, and then perhaps use whatever power the winner is promised to try and undo any damage done. But this resolution now all but literally carved into her soul, Mickey entered her home to try and prepare for whatever would come next. Ashina sighed as she got out of bed and went downstairs. The reason why she was sighing was because she had gone to her children's bedrooms to wake them, but found said rooms empty. Looked like they had woken up even earlier than she did. Well, I guess it's a good thing they have that kind of energy, she thought with a bit of smile. As she walked finished walking downstairs and began to head to the kitchen to start making breakfast, she blinked in surprise when she heard the front door sliding open, followed by the sound of light footsteps coming down the hallway and into the living room area. Ashina quickly exited the kitchen in time to see her daughter turn towards the stairs. The redhead was more than just a bit taken aback by the look of shame and sadness on her face. Ryaiko. She called out. Her daughter paused mid-step and turned to look at her. Oh, morning Koss and even her voice sounded quite sad. Ashina walked up to her. Ryaiko. Honey, what's wrong? She asked, looking a little worried. Her daughter was always a very lively and upbeat girl. For her to look sad and this sad at it was a little startling. They ah. Ryaiko shifted a little uncomfortably as she looked away from her mother. It's nothing, Kasan. Ashina knew better. Ryaiko. Now her voice held just a bit of steel to it, all but stating that lying just wasn't going to cut it with her. It's definitely not nothing that is bothering you. The young girl lowered her head a bit and was silent for a moment. W well. Well what? Kashina gently questioned. Ryaiko lowered her head a bit more. It's on each chan Now Kashina looked a bit taken aback. Naruto. What about him? She asked, genuinely confused. Did her children get into some sort of argument? I just wanted to hang out with him was all, but Ani chan turned me down Ryaiko said sadly. Even now, after taking her time walking back home, her brother's words rang in her mind. The cold tone he had talked in all but pierced her soul. Was she that much of an annoyance to him? Was the idea of two siblings being around one another that repulsive to the elder Namika's child? 
Vishina looked at her daughter in surprise. She hadn't expected that. Why would her son turn down a chance to spend time with his sister? As far as she knew, it wasn't as if Ryaiko did anything that would annoy anyone. Ah is that so? Kishina began, unable to think of how to reply to that. This wasn't what she had expected to hear. I'll be sure to have a talk with Naruto then, whenever he comes home. She knew it wasn't much, but it was the best she could come up with. Then, she smiled a bit in an attempt to try and cheer up Ryaiko a bit. How about some breakfast? What would you like to have? I'll make you what you want, the wife of the Hokage asked her daughter, switching gears as fast as possible. Ryaiko simply turned away from her mother and started to walk up the stairs. Sorry, Kasan. Not really hungry right now. She muttered this just loud enough for Kashina to hear before she reached the second floor and began to head for her home. Kashina was just about to call out to her when she heard her daughter open and close the door to her room. What was that all about? She went to the kitchen, but rather than start on breakfast, she simply sat at the dining table, deep in thought. So deep in thought was she that she didn't realize how much time had passed by until Minato came downstairs. Kashina. What's wrong? Her husband, the Hokage, asked. Ah, Minato. Kashina didn't really know where to start. Minato just blinked at how Kashina's voice sounded, so quiet and contemplative, a far cry from the more vibrant way she spoke. He motioned to upstairs. Just checked on Ryaiko. She looked pretty down. Is there something wrong? He asked again. Kashina then proceeded to tell him what Ryaiko had told her. A few minutes passed by as this occurred, Kashina taking her time and telling her husband how Ryaiko had acted and such. By the end of the very brief news, Minato looked just as surprised as Kashina had by what Ryaiko had told her. Naruto. Really? His wife nodded. Yeah. Surprised me too. Minato looked confused. I I don't understand. Why would Ryaiko look so sad over that? He questioned. He was having a bit of a hard time imagining why Naruto would refuse to spend time with his own sister and apparently to reject her so coldly if the forlorn look on Ryaiko's face was anything to go by. Kashina just shrugged helplessly. I wish I knew. Then a pause. Well, one thing is for certain. I plan to have a talk with him whenever he gets home, she said, sounding determined to do so. Once she sets her mind to something, she's going to see it through to the end. Winato rubbed his chin. Yeah. We will have to have a talk with him. But. He looked at Kashina. Just how do you plan to start talking with him? It just occurred to me that he's not really home that often, at least when we're around. Kashina sighed. T that is a good point. Then she looked down a bit. Come to think of it, I can't really recall him eating dinner with us recently as well you think maybe something is going on with him. She asked her husband. Now it was Minato's turn to shrug. I honestly don't know. Neither of them were aware of the true reason why, that they had all but neglected Naruto for a majority of his life. They had been so intent on training Ryaiko to control the power of the Kayubi and making sure she is also strong enough to defend herself as a Jinchuriki and the daughter of the Hokujin and Yuzumaki. She was a prime target for kidnapping and potential assassinations that they failed to take notice of Naruto, even as the boy had once upon a time tried to get not just their attention, but also the attention of everyone else. But the boy was quiet by nature, and with his sister being the exact opposite of quiet, it had been easy for both Minato and Kishina, and even the rest of the village, to grow incredibly accustomed to focusing on Ryaiko, while almost completely ignoring Naruto. Kishina huffed and crossed her arms across her chest. This feeling of not knowing what was wrong was bothering her. Well. I guess that's something else I can talk with Naruto about. She muttered. Minato nodded. Right. He then looked at a clock nearby and began to stand up. That time already. He began to head to the front door, getting his shinobi sandals along the way. Time for me to head to the office. I'll also have a talk with Naruto too if I happen to bump into him, he said, smiling in what he hoped was a reassuring manner. It must have been so as Kashina slightly cheered up. Okay. She got up and she and her husband kissed briefly before he left. But after Minato left, Kashina's small smile dropped. Despite Minato's words, she still felt a little perturbed. I sure hope nothing bad is going on with either of my kids. She thought. At any rate, all she can do now is simply wait for Naruto to come home and just hope for the best. With this in mind, Kashina decided to head back upstairs for now. Elsewhere in the village, Naruto walked about, with no real destination in mind. Since today was an off day for his team and they wouldn't be meeting for a few more days, he was pretty much free to do as he pleased. Well, I still have to pass this news along to Ryuchi anyway. He thought as he ran a hand through his hair. Still, even with this self-imposed task of telling Ryuchi the little meetup he and Mickey had planned for them, he really had nothing else to do. He could train, true, but he felt that he could wait until perhaps the afternoon to do that. It'll give him a reason to stay out of the house at any rate. But until then, there was really nothing else he could do. 
he could go around to the shops and see if anything catches his eye, but this held little appeal for him, as there was very little that shops could offer that'll actually catch his attention. He could head to Kanoha's public library and see if there's any new books, but that'd simply be a waste of time, as he was a bit picky about what he read, and he already had all of the new books that intrigued him. Then he stopped walking when something occurred to him. I have no damn life. He thought in equal parts shock and anger. Outside of training, missions, and hanging out with Ryuchi and Miki, he literally had nothing else to do. Naruto set his teeth. His fists clenched tightly. But just as quickly as the rage came, it disappeared, leaving him feeling a little solemn. A little too late to be angry about that, I guess. He thought. He started walking again, this time, with a destination. A spot that Ryuchi would like to go to sometimes whenever he wasn't training as much as Naruto did. Naruto figured that if Ryuchi wasn't there, then he'll try Ryuchi's place next. It took him a little more than half an hour to reach the place he was in no particular hurry, but he finally reached it. The Hokage Mountain. And sure enough he spotted Ryuchi sitting on top of the first Hokage's head. Though Naruto's footsteps were unbelievably quiet, Ryuchi still appeared to have heard them. Naruto, he said. One could practically hear the smile in his voice. Morning. Yo, Ryuchi. Naruto smiled too now. Ryuchi turned around to look at him and even stood up. Much like Naruto, Ryuchi had grown over the years and possessed a very lean yet muscular build from all of the tojutsu training he did. Standing at just a few inches shorter than Naruto, Ryuchi was dressed in a plain white shirt with an open short-sleeved black button-up shirt over it. He wore military green pants and black clothes to shinobi sandals. Ryuchi's black hair had also slightly grown and also become a little more messy than it was as when he was young. He put his right hand in his pocket while slightly motioning with his left hand, drawing attention to the black glove he wore on it. You're up and about earlier than usual. Hey, I figured there was no point to just lying around in bed is all, Naruto replied as he kept on walking towards his friend. The same could be said to you though. Ryuchi just smiled. Like you, I didn't see much of a point to staying in bed. Besides, today is an off day for us, so I might as well do something, right? True. Naruto walked past him a bit and took a moment to simply enjoy the sight. Standing atop the first Hokage's head on the mountain gave him an excellent view of the entire village. Combined with the still rising sun, and it made for a view that would put any painting to shame and beauty. Ryuchi moved next to him, and the two proceeded to simply take in the view. Miki and I think we should meet up in a few days for our next group training session, Naruto finally said after a few minutes of silence. Until then, we can just do whatever we want on our own. Ryuchi merely nodded, an action Naruto saw out of the corner of his eye. The two of them remained silent for a little while longer. So what is it, Ryuchi? Naruto asked, having the feeling that his friend wanted to ask him something. Um? Nothing much. Just wonder if anything is bugging you is all, Ryuchi said without taking his gaze off of the village. Nothing's bugging me right now. A pause. Though Ryuko did try to hang out with me earlier. Ah. Ryuchi knew Naruto well enough to know almost exactly how that would go. Yeah. Naruto didn't have to say anything more. Ryuchi looked at him. Since you already talked to Miki, I take it she already said something that I would have said in this situation. When Naruto nodded in confirmation of this, Ryuchi simply smirked almost mirthfully, he and his friends knew each other too well sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Still, being told to give her a chance isn't exactly going to make me want to rush and let her cling to me or anything Naruto sighed. I know. Miki and I are just trying to help, Naruto, Ryuchi replied. Yeah, I know that. Naruto began to sound a little tired. But I tried to get their attention growing up, and that failed spectacularly at every turn. Why should I have to go out of my way to try again when they're clearly not doing anything either? He all but glared at Ryuchi as he spoke those words. He felt he was quite right. He tried to get his sister's and his parents' attention when he was young, and that didn't work at all. So he had come to grudgingly accept the neglect and forge his own path. And his friends wanted him to try and perhaps talk to his family after all these years of essentially being on his own. And well his family still has yet to notice him, save for Ryuko. Not a chance in hell. Now it was Ryuchi's turn to sigh. Look, Naruto. I can't say I fully understand your situation since I'm an orphan while you still have parents, he began, but I can understand that being ignored and left on your own is a painful thing. Back before I met you or Miki, I was on my own, and it was a painful time for me. As a child, I just didn't understand why I was so alone, even in the orphanage, but I knew it hurt. A lot. He stopped looking at the village and now turned to face Naruto. But the pain of being alone went away when I met you and Miki, Naruto. And over the years, I've come to have a few more friends, though none as close to me as you and Miki are. He gazed at Naruto with strong eyes. And now, Miki and I see that with the exception of us as friends, you two are alone. 
and we can't stand to see you in that kind of pain, Naruto. And it is this reason that we have all but been forcing you to try and reconnect with your family so that you can no longer be a lone wolf. Ryuchi and Naruto locked gazes for several seconds after that until the latter turned away, sighing. Naruto scratched the back of his head as he thought. I guess you're right, he eventually said. He looked at Ryuchi again. Sorry. Ryuchi slowly smiled. No worries. Mickey and I are here to support you. Even if it is somewhat against your will. Naruto chuckled. Noted. The two friends proceeded to look over the village once more. Still not going to try and reach out to them anytime soon though, Naruto said offhandedly. Of course, Naruto. Of course, Ryuchi said. At least it was one thing that would never change. Naruto's stubbornness. Elsewhere, in a forest outside a Wagakur, a man stood before a small clearing. The man, tall and muscular from many years of intense training and battling on the front lines of missions, stared straight ahead at the edge of the clearing. There, a makeshift grave could be seen. The man then looked down, a pained and miserable look in his black eyes. He ran a hand through his short dark brown hair. I miss you every day. He muttered, so, so much. His mind was clouded with many thoughts at the moment, leaving him very much unable to fully focus on anything else. Despite this, the man was still perfectly capable of noticing when he was being watched. Such as now. Whoever you are, come out, he growled out as he felt someone watching him just now. He whirled around, turning in the direction he believed the person to be in. He was right, rustling was audible as someone began to make their way out of the forest and into the clearing. The man couldn't see who it was due to his or her height and the way most of the trees and bushes were seemingly bigger than him. And while he could slightly sense some chakra, it was weak, barely on par with adult civilians. However, when the person finally stepped out into the clearing for him to see, the man's eyes widened in shock and he immediately prepared to attack. You. Ha ha ha, it would seem you're not too happy to see me, oaf, Takehiko said, the boy walking up to the man without a care in the world. The man took up a tojutsu stance, remembering quite well everything Takehiko had said earlier that day. I don't know just who think you are, you annoying brat, but now you. Before he could finish the sentence, Takehiko spoke up. Don't bother summoning your magical weapon. It won't do you any good. Not out of eye space, anyway. He smirked. The only thing you'd succeed in doing is simply wasting our time, Katsu. The man, Katsu, stopped what he was doing. He narrowed his eyes. How do you know my name? He demanded, not dropping his stance. Take Heiko laughed. Don't you remember what I told you and the others just a while ago in eye space? There is nothing I cannot know. He kept on walking towards Katsu. Now, will you finally drop your stance, oaf? Or will you try and futilely attack me? Katsu bristled but didn't attack. Instead, he dropped his stance but still made a point to keep his guard up. What the hell do you want? And what did you mean by that just now about summoning my magical weapon? Heikaiko's smirk transformed into a grin. I may have left out a ruler too earlier, he stated. The older man blinked. Left out a ruler too, you say. What, we can't summon our magical weapons outside of that dimension or whatever? He demanded. The kid simply waved a hand dismissively. Not at all. By all means, you can summon your magical weapon whenever you wish. However, one of the rules I left out was that outside of eye space, it is impossible to destroy the magical weapon of other participants in Ragnarok, even with another magical weapon. Odin made this rule to keep all of the fighting and death strictly in eye space. Then he chuckled. Though without any of the other participants knowing this rule, they'll fight each other if they meet outside of eye space and only succeed in wearing themselves down by the time I do invoke eye space. Makes for an easier win on my part that way, he explained. Hatsu looked greatly shocked at this before growling again. He should have known that something had to have been done if the ritual was to take place without any hitches. But there was one other thing bothering him right now. Why are you telling me this? For the second time, Takehiko's grin dropped and he actually looked serious for once. Because, despite all of my posturing back there, even I have to grudgingly admit that winning this ritual will be no easy feat for me, even with my magical weapon. So it would be of great use to me to have some backup. Hatsu now immediately knew where this was going. He raised his head while also folding his arms across his chest. Are you suggesting an alliance between us? He questioned. Take Heiko sighed. Yes, he succinctly replied, though not without a hint of anger. That is exactly what I am saying. Hatsu actually took a step back in surprise. And why choose me as a potential ally? His eyes narrowed once more. What is your reason for doing so? Because for one thing, your magical weapon is one that even I have to admit is impressive. I have seen you in action with it on the rare occasions you used it and what it is capable of was certainly quite a performance. Take Heiko slowly began to smile once more, though not quite as arrogantly as before. And for another reason, if you help me win Ragnarok, then I will in turn help you. 
The eye of the makeshift grave as he said this. Hatsu followed his gaze. I recall what you said earlier. About resurrection being possible. He began. Were you telling the truth? He asked while simultaneously thinking on this. Take Heiko nodded. I may have withheld a ruler too, but I don't lie. A king like me doesn't have to lie. Hatsu fell silent. He looked at Takehiko and then looked at the makeshift grave. His eyes lingered on the latter far longer they had on Takehiko, many emotions visible in his eyes. Fine then, he eventually said, his head dropping to look down at the young Magus. Good. Takehiko smiled up at him, said smile being just like it was before. Confident to the point of pure arrogance. However. Takehiko fell silent as Katsu spoke. Know this. If I think for one second you will turn against me, I will put an end to you, one way or another. And as a jonin of a wagaker, I am more than skilled enough to make your death very painful, Katsu said as he motioned to the clothes he wore, said clothes being the standard attire of an awagaker shinobi. Heikaiko snorted. Very well then. And I should also say the same to you. His eyes narrowed. If you turn against me, then I can assure you that despite my young age, you won't die painlessly. Both of them glared at one another for all of a minute before Katsu nodded slowly. Very well then. With this out of the way, just what comes next? Heikaiko didn't answer him right away. Instead, he turned away and looked off into the distance. Want to know something interesting about magical weapons? More often than not, the beliefs and desires of Omega serve as the basis for his or her magical weapon. The magical weapon will end up possessing abilities that are the result of these beliefs and desires. He looked at Katsu. I'm sure you may have noticed this given your own desire and what your magical weapon is capable of, yes. His new ally simply looked confused. Yes, I have noticed that, if only in passing. But how does that relate to my question? The boy smirked, even chuckled. Because of my beliefs, my magical weapon allows me to easily keep track of all the participants in Ragnarok. It is how I found you so easily. Of course, my magical weapon is capable of much more than that, but that is not the point I'm trying to make here. What I am saying is that I am always up to date on where all the participants are. His smirk became positively vicious. And right now, one participant is heading towards Hai no Kuni, where two other Magi currently are. Hatsu hummed in acknowledgement as he folded his arms across his chest. I see. Then you plan to start this ritual for sure. Oh yes. Take Heiko looked in the direction of Hai no Kuni, his smirk never wavering. I'll give the three a few days for them all to be in relatively the same spot. Then, we'll start this game. Elsewhere, on a path that leads past a small village, a young slender girl could be seen walking there. She appeared to be no older than 16, with pale skin and long pale blonde hair that went down just a bit past her shoulder blades. She walked oddly, almost limply, with a mesh shirt she wore hanging just a bit off her shoulders. She wore a small coat over it that grey in color, which happened to match the color of the shorts she wore. The black thigh-high shinobi sandals the girl wore also somehow clumped on the dirt road. The girl stared straight ahead, her dark red eyes showing virtually no emotion. Her stare was so chilling that any passerbys on the path would avoid her, shivering as they passed her, as if death just washed over them. She noticed this, but did nothing. She had far better things to deal with. Like finding the other Magi participating in Ragnarok so that she can fulfill her wish. And with this thought in mind, the teenage girl continued her trek to and through Hai no Kuni. Naruto fumed as he walked down the dirt road, his teeth set in much irritation. It had been a few days since his little chat with Ryuchi atop the Hokage Monument and already he found the idea Ryuchi all but preached to him of slowly opening up to his family to be a very hard task. The reason why? When he had come home later that day, he was approached by his mother. Even to this very moment, he could recall virtually every word spoken. Flashback start. Naruto had spent just a bit more than half an hour hanging out with Ryuchi, simply chatting about what kind of group training they'll do and the likes before finally heading home. He felt he might as well nap away in his bed for the rest of the day, since he had nothing else to do. However, when he got home, he was quite surprised to see Kashina sitting at the dining table, a serious expression on her face. Asan, Naruto eventually greeted after getting over the surprise. Naruto. Kashina's voice sounded just as serious as she looked. It made Naruto blink in surprise. Where were you? She was rather surprised to see Naruto back this early, though she considered it good fortune, since she had just come back downstairs barely a few minutes ago to wait for him. Nowhere really. Just out, Naruto replied. He was starting to get a little confused. He would often go days and on rarer occasions, weeks at a time without much of a conversation with either of his parents, so that his mother was apparently trying to start a conversation with him like this was throwing him off a bit. Ashina just slowly nodded. I see. Silence fell upon them both. Naruto stood where he was, hands in pockets as he tried to figure out just what it was Kashina wanted right now. 
As for Kashina herself, she was a bit torn, just how was she supposed to address the issue at hand? Should she just bluntly ask her son about it or should she go for a more subtle approach? Should she try and chat him up calmly for a bit before slipping in a question or two about what happened with Riaiko? The wife of the Hokage lightly rocked her head from side to side as she silently mulled over this. This went on for a moment before Naruto finally broke the silence. Is something the matter? He asked, trying to keep the growing annoyance out of his voice as he gave up on trying to figure out what was going on here. Kashina snapped out of her thoughts and glanced at her son. As soon as she did so, she finally reached her decision on how to proceed. Being an Uzumaki, subtlety was never her strong suit, so she went with her usual approach to things. Did you do anything to Riaiko? She asked calmly. Naruto blinked in surprise, his eyes widening slightly before they suddenly narrowed in anger. He now knew exactly what this was about, Riaiko must have told Kishina what had happened. No. Kishina now narrowed her eyes at her son, feeling a little skeptic. There had to be a reason why Riaiko had looked so sad. Riaiko came home some time ago, looking crushed. She said you turned down her offer to spend time together. The eldest Namaka's child did his best to keep a growl from escaping his throat. Yeah, that did happen, he muttered, just loud enough for her to hear. Why would you do that? Kashina asked him. She just wanted to spend some time with you. Is spending time with your Amado so bad that you'd turn her down? She had asked this in a confused and almost disbelieving tone of voice. She couldn't understand why such a thing would have happened. But to Naruto, who had spent very little time with his parents growing up, he didn't register her voice as sounding confused. He registered it as an almost accusatory tone of voice. So it was with this in mind that he decided to retaliate in a way. So what? He said. Just because we're siblings doesn't mean we should have to spend time together. I have better things to do than be around her, the hero of Konoha. He spat the word hero as though it was a curse, as all the years of neglect and being in his sister's shadow began to rear its ugly head. At the tone he took with her, Kashina actually leaned back in her seat, as though she was just smacked. She never would have imagined her son taking such a tone with her. Then her eyes all but began to blaze as it just occurred to her that her child had just talked back. Naruto, she said very sternly. How could you say that? The two of you are family. We're all family. Naruto's breath hitched, and now it was his turn to look as if he was struck. Family. That was a word he never had heard before in a context related to him and the other Namikazes. Then, the shock disappeared and was replaced by anger. We're family. He growled out, loud enough for anyone in the house to hear. Like hell we are. He yelled that so loudly it actually shook the room a bit. Kishina nearly jumped out of her chair, shock etched deeply onto her face. And Naruto. Kishina's voice sounded so quiet now. She had been waiting for him to come with the intention of first asking what exactly had happened with Riaiko, followed by if there was anything was wrong for him. But now, after he yelled like that, the redeed was now at a loss for words. She stood up slowly, her eyes, so full of shock and even hurt, never leaving Naruto. H how can you say that? She all but whispered. She had never heard such rage in her son's voice before. Naruto's glare grew worse. He removed his hands from his pockets and balled them tightly into fists. You're asking me how I can say that. Now he sounded much quieter, but the rage was still there. If you can't figure out the reason why I'm saying that, then I'm not telling you. Without another word, he turned around and started to walk away. Oh on each an Riaiko's voice called out. Naruto stopped mid-step. He turned his head and looked up at an angle to see Riaiko standing at the top of the stairs. His yells must have gotten her attention if the stiff almost frightened posture of the girl was anything for him to go by. Ani chan W what did we do wrong? She asked as her eyes began to water a bit. She was an emotional girl by nature and the few words Naruto had yelled just now winded her deeply. Naruto now turned his glare on her, making take a step back. What do you do wrong? You still have fucking figured it out. He yelled, his temper beginning to hit its critical point. His fists clenched even tighter, almost drawing blood. You know what, screw this, he growled a few seconds later. Without another word spoken, he stormed out of the house, before either Riaiko or Kashina could do or say anything to try and stop him. Flashback end. He had spent the rest of that day out of the house and at the training field, training himself into the ground to work out the anger that had surprisingly overcome that time. Should have yelled at them more, he muttered as he continued walking down the dirt road. And it didn't help me calm down either when he tried to talk to me. He spoke of his father, Minato. The Hokage, after having heard from Kashina of the talk having gone very bad very quickly, had tried to corner him just the day after that and question him on the matter too. Minato had approached him gently, confused and shocked, but just like what had happened with Kashina, Naruto had registered his voice as sounding slightly accusatory and nearly blew up on him too. 
After that second failed talk, he had taken to staying out of the house as much as he could, only returning home long after his parents and sister had gone to bed. And it was now, on the day that he was to meet up with Miki and Ryuchi for some group training, that Naruto had decided to head out to small village close by Kanahagakur to do some shopping. He figured he might as well pick up some snacks for him and his team to have after training, and since these healthy little snacks weren't sold in any shops in Kanoha, he had to travel outside of the village to get them. At least with the snacks, we'll be spending more time out of our homes, Naruto thought, slightly hefting the small bag that he held with his left hand. He really hoped that the group training and the eating of these snacks would take up a considerable amount of time, he still had no intention of heading home any time before sundown. As he continued his trek back home, the blonde teen couldn't help but think to himself on a few things. Namely, the situation with his family. Though he resolved himself to be out as late as possible for a time, he knew that he couldn't avoid them forever. Ryaiko knew his hangout spots, and his parents were skilled and powerful shinobi that could track him down if need be. And the last thing he wanted for them to look for him and potentially interrupt something. He walked on in silence until 20 minutes later, as he passed through a particularly large part of the forest that existed between Kanoha and many of the minor villages in Hai no Kuni, he heard the sound of running water. The waterfall, maybe? He thought as he came to a stop in the road. He had taken a short way to the minor village and was now taking a longer way back to enjoy the scenery and silence. Aside from traveling on missions, he rarely got to see and experience certain things, so seeing a hopefully large waterfall sounded a bit appealing to him. He looked up at the sky for a second. I still have some time before we're supposed to meet up, he thought, I can afford to spend several more minutes. With this in mind, the eldest Namaka's child changed course and made his way towards the sound of the running water. Just like with his walk down the dirt road just now, Naruto took his time walking through the forest towards the waterfall, letting his mind go blank so that he can calmly hear and enjoy the sounds of nature all around him. A few minutes later, he reached a clearing in the forest, an area that was right next to a very small mountain. Sure enough, water poured from what he presumed to be a small stream on the mountain and into a large pond. He would have enjoyed the small yet peaceful sight were it not for one thing. Someone was bathing in the pond. Said someone was a teenage girl. And she was naked. And she also happened to be facing forward in his general direction, giving the young Namikas a clear view of her body. Ah. Naruto's face turned red as he quickly spun around. He slapped a hand over his face as if to try and rid himself of the sight he had just unintentionally been a witness to. The sound of splashing water could be heard. Naruto tensed as he could also hear the girl move a bit closer, undoubtedly to try and clobber him for looking, unintentionally or not. Eh sorry, he muttered, loud enough for the girl to hear, he hoped. I heard the sound of the waterfall, thought it'd be cool to see it. I had no idea someone would be here well bathing. He said, summing up what had happened quickly and concisely, in order to perhaps try and calm what he assumed would be an irate female. So it was much to his surprise when instead of hearing the girl so pale and those red eyes, Naruto thought get angry and start yelling at him, he heard a very calm, almost emotionless voice. Who are you? Naruto was about to answer that, but stopped before he could even speak when he heard a loud and strange growling sound. Ah. The girl sounded embarrassed. Hearing her patter stomach, Naruto cautiously raised his left hand, which still carried the bag. You. Hungry. Back in Kanoha, more specifically, training field 13, Ryuchi sat atop one of the boulders there as he waited for Naruto to come so that the team could start their group training. He was not alone though, Miki was there as well, leaning up against the Sakura tree that Naruto cherished so much. A look of slight apprehension and some other emotions Ryuchi couldn't immediately identify was upon her face. Miki? Something wrong? He asked his friend. The A? Miki replied dumbly. Apparently, she had been deep in thought over something. Is something wrong? Ryuchi repeated. Miki waved him off, but did so just a bit too quickly. Ah, uh, no. It's nothing. Just had a bit of a hard time getting to sleep is all, she answered with a smile, but it was a bit strained. Ryuchi narrowed his eyes microscopically, easily seeing through the lie. But he decided not to push it, if Miki, a girl who was usually quite outgoing, was being this secretive about something, then it had to be bad. But he couldn't just pressure her into telling him, so he'd have to wait until Miki was a bit calmer before trying to coax the truth out of her. As for Miki, her thoughts were a mess. Just as she told Ryuchi, she really was suffering from a lack of sleep. Ever since that Teikaiko boy had dragged her and others into that ice space dimension, she had been a wreck. Granted, at first she was determined to make it through this sick ritual that Teikaiko dared to call a game, and she was still very much determined to do so, but she had expected him to start the battles not long after announcing Ragnarok's start. And yet, he hasn't. 
if it was simply the case of giving them all a full day before invoking I space, then she would understand that, but it's been a few days since he appeared before her, and now the tension was beginning to get to her, as she realized that he could be activating I space whenever he wanted, even at night. Wielding a large practice sword in her right hand, Mickey clenched it tightly. And it's not just that either. She thought in worry. Remembering very clearly what Takehiko had said about how Magi awakened their abilities, her thoughts were focused on one thing in particular. The unknown stones that bond with Magi. She recalled the three stones she, Ryuchi, and Naruto had found long ago as kids. There's no doubt, those things had to be the stones he was speaking of, she thought. That would mean that like her, Ryuchi and Naruto were Magi. Whether or not they had awakened or were even aware of this was unknown to her, but that's not what worried her. What did worry her was whether or not that meant the two of them were also going to be involved in this ritual. She did her best to avoid biting down on her lip. If they were, then that meant that no matter what, they'd have to fight and potentially end up removed from existence. Even though their deaths at some point in Ragnarok would prevent the world from being consumed by ice space, the mere thought of them suffering such a fate terrified Mickey beyond belief. Please don't let them be involved in this, Mickey silently prayed. Please, leave my friends out of this. If she had expected an answer of sorts to this prayer, she received none. The grip on her sword tightened even more, nearly splintering the hilt. She really hoped her prayer would be answered. Back with Naruto, the teenage boy was currently sitting on a particularly grassy spot next to the pond, a slight bead of sweat rolling down the side of his face, his mouth slightly ajar. MMMMMM. The girl now dressed, much to Naruto's relief, though her clothing did look a little odd to him, was currently munching away on the last of the snacks he had bought. And I bought enough to keep us fed for an hour or two. He thought numbly as the girl had eaten all of the snacks, leaving him to simply be a witness to the surprising gluttony she demonstrated. If his stare bothered the girl, she didn't show it. Instead, she simply sighed in contentment as she finally finished up the last snack and she slumped back, her red eyes looking up at the sky. Those. Were some pretty tasty snacks, she commented. Why yeah, Naruto started, blinking, glad you like them. Uh. He trailed off and made a slight gesture with his hand towards the girl. She turned and stared at him, confused. Then a form of understanding appeared in her eyes. Ah, my name's Yuko, she introduced herself, a small smile forming on her face. Naruto smiled now. I'm Naruto. Nice to meet you. Yuko's smile disappeared and she now gazed at Naruto sternly, sizing him up. Naruto simply blinked in surprise at the sudden change, but remained silent. Then, Yuko spoke up a few minutes later. You're not saying that just because you expect me to pay you back or something, right? Naruto's face went from showing confusion at her actions at first to surprise. What? No. Yuko raised an eyebrow. You sure? How do I know that? She sounded pretty cautious now, moving away from Naruto a bit. How she was beginning to sound a little uncertain, even a little afraid. How do I know you won't try and force yourself on me? She demanded, folding her arms across her chest protectively. At this, Naruto leapt to his feet in shock. What? Why the hell would I do something like that? Yuko seemed to shrink in on herself, her gaze never leaving Naruto. Cause, she began, that's what a few other guys I've run into tried to do. Naruto's breath hitched a bit. She had said it so sincerely that she couldn't be lying, and he didn't detect any other sign of deceit either. He prayed that nothing had actually happened to her. He closed his eyes for a moment and sighed. I. I don't know just who you had the misfortune of running into in the past, he started. He opened his eyes and gazed at Yuko. His eyes contained nothing but complete honesty. But I would never do anything like that. To anyone. Yuko just kept looking at him. How do I know that? You did see me in the buff. You even blushed. At that, Naruto coughed a bit in embarrassment and even lightly blushed. Why yeah, I did, but like I said earlier, I had no idea that someone would be here bathing of all things. And blushing is a natural response to. Well, something like that, he finished lamely. So it was with this said that he calmly sat back down, his eyes never leaving Yuko. So. What do you say? We cool. He asked. The red-eyed girl simply continued to look at him for a moment longer before cautiously dropping her guard, a small smile slowly appearing on her face again. Okay. I believe you then. She said slowly. Naruto smiled slowly. Oh okay then, he repeated awkwardly. Sorry. For being so cautious. Yuko paused. Well, not exactly sorry, but... Naruto waved her off. Don't worry about it. If what you said was true, then you had every right to look ready to attack or run. Now it was his turn to pause. S.A., sorry if this is blunt or anything, but what you said about guys just now. Ah. No, they didn't actually force themselves on me. I've come across a few bandits that tried that, but I managed to fight them off, Yuko answered. Naruto let out a breath he didn't know he had been holding. Oh oh, okay. 
he felt relieved to hear that, if she really had been violated, aside from perhaps taking her to receive some potentially long overdue physical and mental treatment back in Kanoha, Naruto honestly wasn't sure what he'd do. Aside from perhaps tracking the bandits down and beating them to a pulp for such a horrific action, of course. He looked up in surprise when he heard Yuko actually giggle. You you're a cool guy, she said, her face slightly red. Normally people tend to stay away from me for one reason or another, leaving me to myself. So being able to talk with someone so calmly like this is really nice. She said this quietly, but Naruto still heard her. I see. He sounded almost solemn. So you must have been on your own too, huh? Eh? Yuko looked at him confused. I've been alone for quite some time too, he began. He looked up at the sky and sighed. Aside from two very close friends of mine, I really don't have anyone else. Well, I do have a family, but for the longest time, I've always been ignored by them and everyone else in my village, and that's a fact that probably won't be changing anytime soon he drifted off as he thought on this. Having been so angry lately at his parents and sister, he hadn't really had a chance to do anything to blow off all that steam, what with Ryuchi and Miki doing their own thing, and all until today. So being able to tell someone this, even if said person was someone he just barely met was kind of nice. An amicus teen looked back at Yuko, a small yet kind smile on his face. I guess that makes us two of a kind in a way. So assuming it's possible, we should probably try to look out for one another, huh? The smile dropped though a second later, and he blinked in surprise when Yuko's face turned even redder than it was just a moment ago. Air, Yuko-san. He called out, using an honorific since they had only met. You okay? The A? Yuko seemed a little dazed, as if something was on her mind. Ah, no, I'm fine. A pause. Say, do you mind if I call you Naruto-kun? Naruto tilted his head in slight confusion, but was still quick to respond. Ah, go ahead. I don't mind. D then, Naruto-kun, she said a little nervously. Yeah? Naruto responded. See can we be friends? She asked shyly. Naruto, for the first time in a few days, truly smiled, said smile practically reaching his ears. Sure. His smile did freeze in place though when Yuko seemed to stop moving and tried to say something, only for a stutter to come out of her mouth. Odd. She's acting like Mickey does sometimes. He thought, completely oblivious. It took a minute or two for Yuko to finally regain her composure, but when she did, she smiled brilliantly. T thanks. This, it really means a lot to me. Yeah, same here. Naruto smiled before looking back up at the sky. Hmm, but I should probably get going to do some group training though, we had promised to meet up today, he thought aloud as he noticed the time. At that, Yuko looked surprised and sad that her new friend would already be going, and so abruptly too. Then he looked back at Yuko. Yuko-san, would you like to come with me? He asked. You can come with me to meet my team, if you want. And. If that's not your thing, we can still talk on the way back. Yuko looked surprised yet again, but then smiled. That that sounds great. Naruto smiled and then stood. As he did so, he offered his hand to the still-sitting Yuko, getting a blush out of her as she grabbed hold of the hand and was helped up by him. No one has ever helped her before, even for mundane things like this. Let's go, he said with a smile. Elsewhere, Take Haiko and Katsu watched all of this from afar. The former smirked. She took a bit longer than I had expected, but she's finally close to the other two participants, he commented as he watched Yuko and Naruto from the top of a mountain a few miles away. Despite the distance, he could see the two of them clearly for all Magi, upon awakening their abilities, had enhanced senses. Though by no means infallible, it certainly made seeing and hearing certain things easy. So now that she is in the general vicinity of the other two, do you plan to activate eye space? Katsu questioned gruffly from beside the young boy. Yes. I'll give them just a few more minutes to approach Kanoha and then start the game for good, Take Haiko replied. His larger ally looked at him. And what of the boy next to her? Won't he notice her disappearing when you activate eye space? Take Haiko snorted. Oh, he will, but there is nothing he can do about it, once eye space is activated, the only way for it to disappear aside from me dismissing it would be for one of the participants to lose. Either that or, of course, they fail to kill anyone and end up letting eye space destroy the world. HMPH. Tell me then, as great a chance as there is of one of the three participants being defeated, what if such a thing doesn't happen? Katsu asked. I highly doubt you'll just let them pass the time limit and watch as eye space consumes the world. The boy turned to face Katsu. Of course, I do. Katsu actually looked a bit surprised. He hadn't actually expected him to say that. Oh, is that so? Then do you plan for us to fight if things don't go your way today? Heikaiko shook his head. No. We'll be fighting another day. Then he smirked again. Instead, if the three of them refuse to fight or simply cannot kill each other, there will be another Magus to come along and take one of them out. 
Hatsu hummed in acknowledgement. I have the feeling that this Magus isn't going to stumble across them by pure chance. He gazed evenly at Takehiko. I am not the only one you've made an alliance with, am I? The boy blinked once, his expression faltering for a second before it returned. You you're surprisingly perceptive. Headstrong and quick to anger I may be, Katsu commented, fully aware of his faults, but a fool, I am not. Tuckling, Takehiko looked away from Katsu. I see. Very well then, let's start this game. He raised his right arm up and then snapped his fingers. The sound of a water drop rang out across all of the lands, audible only to the participants of Ragnarok. A brilliant light flooded the world for all of an instant before disappearing to reveal the change that had occurred. I space had been activated. W what is this? Ryuchi muttered in shock, getting up off of the boulder he had been sitting on. He immediately took up a defensive stance in case of an attack. All around him, everything seemed the same as before, but the entire world seemed odd, almost transparent and colored slightly blue. The atmosphere was also different, filled with something that the team couldn't identify. Is this some kind of attack? Ryuchi pondered aloud. Then he turned to Miki to see if she was alright. He hadn't expected her to be standing almost ramrod straight, looking at him with wide, terrified eyes. No, Miki thought, no, no, no. Her prayer had seemingly gone unfulfilled after all. Back with Naruto and Yuko, the former, much like his friend Ryuchi, was very much surprised by this. W what the hell? He exclaimed, instinctively taking up a fighting stance when ice space had been invoked. He spun all around, noting that the strange transparent look seemed to apply to everything in the area, at least as far as he knew. Is this some kind of Jinjutsu? He wondered. Then he spoke to Yuko. You alright? He asked, still keeping his guard up in case of an attack. Yuko didn't respond. Yuko-san. He spoke. Still no answer. Turning around to see if she was hurt, Naruto was instead surprised to see that Yuko standing perfectly still, her eyes wide in shock. Then Yuko's head slumped forward and her shoulders sagged. No. Why did you? She muttered. Yuko-san. Naruto called out, dropping his stance now and walking up to her. Then he stopped when she suddenly began to shake. Why did you have to be one? Yuko muttered, this time louder than before. She raised her head, and Naruto was surprised to see her eyes welling with tears a bit. Why Yuko-san? What is it? Instead of actually answering him, Yuko took a few steps, spreading her arms out a bit to the sides. Naruto-kun. I'm sorry for what comes next, but... Naruto felt a chill run down his spine as an odd aura formed around Yuko. He didn't know what this mysterious energy was, but it definitely wasn't chakra. But I need to get my wish fulfilled Yuko quietly spoke, her voice slowly becoming devoid of emotion. Then she closed her eyes for all of a second before opening them, the tears that had been forming now gone. Gate open. Naruto was forced to cover his eyes as a flash of light seemed to engulf Yuko. Though it was nowhere near as bright as the flash of light just prior to this strange change in the world, it was still sudden enough and bright enough to be a cause for alarm. The light stopped and Naruto immediately uncovered his eyes and looked at Yuko. His jaw dropped slightly at the sight. Before him, Yuko stood to her full height, her legs and arms shifted from their earlier positions to form a battle stance that he's never seen before. But what it is attention were the four cyclone blades that Yuko held in her hands. Each blade had three points with curved edges. A number of strange lines and markings were all over the blades and seemed to pulse with the strange energy Naruto had just sensed, said energy flashing from one color to another constantly. Naruto took a step back, subtly shifting into a battle stance. Yuko-san. Yuko looked him, her eyes now emotionless, though there seemed to be a glimmer of sadness in her red eyes. Naruto-kun, I'm sorry that this had to happen, but... She raised her arms. As soon as she did so, two of the blades literally levitated out of her hands and proceeded to move until they were positioned just above the eye for me. That was when Yuko finally attacked. Somewhere else in Hai no Kuni, a young man was walking casually, a look of amusement on his face, despite the fact that the world around him was different. This young man appeared to be just around the same age as Naruto, but a few years older, with brown shaggy hair and a lean physique, hidden underneath the simple dress shirt and shinobi pants he wore. He also wore open toot sandals. His eyes were closed, and his mouth seemed to be permanently curled upwards into a smug smile. Ha, ah, looks like Taekyan has already started the ritual, the young man commented to himself, noting that ice space was active now. I wonder who is going to fight who right now. He was supposed to simply wait around until Taekaiko called for him in the case of Tumagi not killing each other, but he couldn't help but feel curious as to how the first fight of Ragnarok will go. The young man chuckled. Well, I don't think Taekyan will mind it if I watch from afar, right? He thought to himself. The young man then proceeded to continue his trek towards Konoha, hoping that the first battle will be close by there like Takeiko said. He sure hoped he'd be there in time to see who'd win. 
but Miki and Ryuchi, the two were still in training field 13 and very much reacting to this change in their own ways. Ryuchi, for his part, was looking at Miki in worry as he saw that she was deathly pale. Miki? He received no reply. Miki. He said a bit louder and he approached her. He paused briefly when he saw that she was shaking a bit. What is going on here? He thought. It was completely unlike his best female friend to be so shook up. Even back when she made her first kill, she wasn't shaking as badly as she was now. And he couldn't think of a reason why this strange change in the world would be causing such a reaction in her. Mickey? He said one last time, placing his hands on her shoulders firmly. Because he had all but exclaimed her name right in her face, this time, the girl did react. She stopped shaking and raised her head, looking at Ryuchi. Ah Ryuchi. She looked ready to cry. Ryuchi slowly let go of her and backed away to give her some space. Mickey. Just what is going on here? Why are you so scared of? Whatever it is that's happening right now. He questioned. Mickey opened her mouth to answer, stopped, opened it again, only to stop yet again. She looked down, her fists clenched very tightly. Ryuchi. Do you have any idea of what is going on right now? She first asked. Ryuchi blinked. Then he shook his head. No. But it looks like you do. He pointed out softly. Mickey's head lowered a bit more. Just wanted to check first. She then raised her head and looked her friend right in the eyes. Ryuchi, the thing is, right now, she began to explain with the hopes he'll believe her, but was cut off when both she and Ryuchi suddenly found themselves lurching about, the ground rumbling. What? Ryuchi cried out, startled. Then both of them looked to see off in the considerable distance some kind of explosion. What really caught their eyes about it was that it didn't look normal either, the smoke being a glowing multitude of colors such as blue, yellow, green, and more. The two of them went perfectly still as they did some quick thinking and realized that the explosion must have occurred on the path Naruto should be taking back to the village. Naruto-kun. Mickey cried out before suddenly taking off, moving at a speed beyond that of an ordinary genin. Hell, it was even beyond that of an average jounin. H hey, wait for me. Ryuchi said before running off after her. But Naruto, the son of the Hokage was doing his best to try and wrap his mind around what was happening. Just a moment or two ago, something odd had just gone on with the world followed by Yuko suddenly summoning weapons of a sort he had never seen before and using some form of energy that he also had never encountered until now. Hell, he didn't even know that there were other forms of energy aside from chakra that existed. But what's more is that now Yuko, who had asked him to be her friend, was now trying to kill him, with a large smoldering crater before him being evidence enough for this. You're pretty fast Yuko quietly said as she walked around the crater, all four of the blades she had summoned now spinning in place above her shoulders and head. Naruto tensed, prepared to dodge yet again. But he wasn't sure if he could, though he was exceptionally fast for his age group due to focusing almost primarily on physical ability and tojutsu, the only reason he had been able to dodge the strange attack from just now appeared to be due to Yuko getting a feel for his speed and skill. He couldn't be sure though just yet. Yuko-san, I'll ask one last time, why are you trying to kill me? He yelled at the girl. Didn't we become friends and what did you mean by what you said just a minute ago, about being one of something? And what about a wish? His tone of voice had switched from one of shock and anger to one of questioning, as he distinctly recalled what the red-eyed girl had said. Yuko narrowed her eyes, several emotions flitting through those red orbs of hers. The floating blades began to spin even faster, making Naruto prepare to move, as the strange energy from before began to pulse through them. So you really don't know then. Suddenly, a beam of pure energy shot out from the center of the floating blades and right at Naruto at a speed that would make a Chunin look slow in comparison. But Naruto was faster than a number of Chunin, thanks to his insane physical training, and he was ready for it too, leaping to the right to avoid the beams. The beams struck the spot where he had been standing and caused a huge explosion, shaking the ground, and the shock wave generated was enough to nearly make blonde-haired teens stumble. That was when Yuko reached over her right shoulder and casually plucked the nearest of the blades out of its floating spot and then flung it right at Naruto like a shuriken. Naruto then took advantage of the fact he was stumbling to fall back in order to avoid the thrown blade, only to pull a wordless kawarimi with a nearby log when the blade changed direction in mid-toss and moved down. Naruto appeared where the log had been, roughly several yards away from Yuko. Hearing, but not actually looking at, the blade splitting through the log, he charged at the girl, who currently had her back to him. He charged at full speed, pumping chakra into his muscles to move at down in level speed. But he heard Yuko's breath hitch and saw her begin to turn around, with slightly widened eyes. She may look as if she had some experience fighting bandits, but not shinobi from the looks of it, Naruto thought as he then leapt at her and threw a punch. From a physical standpoint, Naruto was as strong as he was fast, being able to lift up a boulder the size of himself without using chakra, and he could smash it with his strongest punch too. 
using chakra, his strength was even greater. So it was very much to his surprise when Yuko, a girl that from a clinical glance at her body did little to no strength training, lashed out with her hand at a speed greater than his own and caught his chakra-enhanced punch. What? The blonde thought in shock. Erg. Yuko's pale but beautiful face looked strained and her arm looked tensed from having caught Naruto's strong punch, but she still had a good grasp on him and she wordlessly ordered one of the blades still by her to shoot out. Performing another Kawarimi Jutsu, Naruto was able to free himself from Yuko's surprisingly strong hold and now had a good view of the blade, slicing through another plain old log he had swapped with. What? He continued to question even as Yuko had the two remaining blades fire the strange energy beams at him, making him constantly move around to avoid being hit. What is it that I don't know? Yuko now finally began to move around herself, jumping back to put some distance between her and Naruto. At the same time she did this, the two blades she had flung at Naruto sprang to life, flinging themselves at Naruto in an attempt to cut him. That right now, you and I are participants in a ritual, she said, her voice being perfectly even. The ritual Naruto questioned as he tilted his head to the left to narrowly avoid one of the blades, while lightly jumping over the other that had tried to take out his feet. Yes. Yuko called back the two blades, which shot past Naruto, making him twist his body to avoid having his back cut by them. The two blades returned to Yuko's side, and the two other blades she had floating above her head repositioned themselves so that they were side by side with the other two that had just returned. The girl began to slowly walk to the right, her eyes on the ground as she appeared to think. Naruto kept his guard up, matching her pace as he too walked. This ritual is called Ragnarok, if I recall the words of that kid correctly, Yuko began. And it's a ritual for Magi, ones who use magic to fight. Magic? Naruto asked, his voice laced with a bit of disbelief. Yeah. I won't give you all of the details, Naruto-kun, since that'll take a bit too long for my tastes, but to get to the point, only Magi can enter this dimension I space and no one else. Yuko paused. She stopped walking and looked at Naruto now, her red eyes gazing at him intensely. And here in I space, we Magi must fight and kill one another. Otherwise, something bad will happen if we don't. Naruto was rooted in place, his disbelief growing. Out of all the things he had expected to hear, he definitely hadn't expected to hear about magic. But what does this have to do with a wish? Whoever wins this ritual no, perhaps game really is the better word here the winner will have the power to fulfill whatever wish he or she desires, Yuko said. Her eyes blaze now with quiet yet fierce determination. And Naruto-kun, I intend to be the winner. I can't afford to lose. And with that, a powerful burst of mana not that Naruto still knew what this was erupted from Yuko, the mana being a variety of bright colors. The four blades her magical weapon spun even faster than before and began to generate a lot of power, enough to make Naruto shiver and immediately begin to go through the short list of jutsus he knew. Crap, whatever she now has planned, I probably won't be fast enough to dodge. Arg, why must I know only a few jutsus outside of the academy ones? He thought, cursing his bad luck. He was snapped out of his thoughts when very abruptly one of the blades all but disappeared in a flash. The next thing the blonde knew, there was a cut across his upper right thigh. Arg. He cried out, nearly dropping to his knee as pain suddenly exploded in his thigh. He was used to pain due to both his intense training and to the kinds of missions he went on with Ryuchi and Miki, but there must have been some kind of odd quality to the blade, for this injury hurt far more than it should. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun. Gone was the emotionless voice from the past few minutes. Instead, Yuko now sounded sad and quite apologetic. She sighed as she walked forward a few feet before stopping, intent on keeping a distance between the two of them. Please believe me when I say that I never wanted for this to happen. Naruto grinded his teeth together as he attempted to stand up, but the pain in his thigh was too much for him to do so at the speed he'd prefer. Ah. Yuko looked at his wound, sadness flickering through her eyes. It hurts, doesn't it? So much more than it normally should. An effect of this particular blade, just so you know. Said blade floated back to Yuko's side, spinning at a much slower rate than the other three were now. Naruto looked from his wound and glared at Yuko. Yuko actually averted her gaze, not looking back at him, and instead motioned a hand towards one of the other floating blades. My magical weapon is called Overload, she began as the three blades spun even faster and glowed more intensely. Each of the blades affects a different sense and slowly overloads it until the person hit is rendered defenseless. As you can most likely notice by now. And sure enough, Naruto found himself having a harder time focusing on anything save for his thigh injury, which was beginning to hurt more and more. His face began to contort in great pain, his mouth opened up into the beginnings of a silent scream. Then one of the three still intensely glowing blades shot out in a flash and cut Naruto across his left shoulder. Naruto startled from the hit and willed himself through the increasing pain to look at the new wound. He then attempted to move his left arm, hoping that the blade didn't render it useless. 
It still moved, so that was one small mercy at any rate. Berg. The pain grew worse, and now he was beginning to feel woozy. His sense of proprioception has been affected as suddenly, the blonde teen slowly began to become acutely aware of each and every single movement within his own body. More specifically, he became even more aware of the nerves currently transmitting the feeling of pain. Yuko turned her head upwards. Two hits should be enough. She muttered, her shoulders slumping. Then she looked at Naruto once she noticed that his head had slumped forward. I'll say it again, Naruto-kun. I'm so sorry. The two blades that she had struck him with then moved next to one another, floating directly in front of Yuko, while the other two moved forward to join them. The two blades that hit Naruto began to spin faster and glow brighter until they were even outdoing the other two blades in both areas. It's time to finally end this with one of my more powerful attacks. Yuko sounded so calm as she said it. She raised her hands and slowly thrust them forward. Naruto, through all of the pain from simply two injuries, felt his mind begin to slip into unconsciousness. Yet through this pain, he felt determined to try and stand up. Damn it, body, move. He thought angrily as he tried to force himself to get up. He stood up just a few more inches. Yuko's blade's overload began to flash in unison, as though signaling something. Undoubtedly, it signaled Yuko's attack, like some kind of strange warning. Naruto tiredly raised his eyes to look at Yuko. Was this how it was going to end for him? Being killed in some strange dimension by a girl supposedly using magic. No way, he thought as he once again tried to get up. I'm not gonna die today. Yuko's blades finally glowed one last time before they all suddenly fired off one big blast of concentrated magical energy. Given the distance between the blade's position and Naruto, the blast which also happened to be moving at a speed only a cage-level shinobi could dodge would hit Naruto in less than a nanosecond. But to the blonde, it felt like time slowed down, giving him a good long look at the attack that would be his end. No. Naruto actually yelled out as he fully forced himself to his feet. I'm gonna survive this. This, he thought. Then, a strange yet powerful sensation overcame him. The pain and wooziness that plagued him subsided. He closed his eyes for the briefest of instances before opening them, his eyes blazing with determination. And in a loud voice, right before the blast could hit him, he let out his own little battle cry, the words coming to him as if they were completely natural. Gate, open. Fake Haiko and Katsu, watching from afar, were taken aback as suddenly a blinding pillar of ocean blue light appeared, blasting upwards into the sky. The clouds and ice space parted, the ground rumbled, and a number of trees nearby were literally blown away, while others flat out disintegrated from being too close to the pillar of pure energy. What powerful mana. Katsu commented, putting a hand in front of his eyes to block out the light. Fake Haiko didn't answer, instead staring intently at the scene taking place with wide eyes. Impossible. He muttered. This definitely hadn't been what he was expecting. Off in the distance yet rapidly approaching, Miki and Ryuchi were witness to the blinding light as well. Miki nearly yelled out in surprise, coming to a dead stop and closing her eyes. The light was far too bright. Damn it. She internally swore. She couldn't afford to truly move at full speed, since that would most likely bring up more questions from Ryuchi that she couldn't afford to answer just yet not until she was certain that Naruto was safe, before thinking of a way to get all three of them through this, but now it seemed like this pillar of ocean blue light was going to try and slow her down too. The sheer power was enough to nearly blow her back as she tried to move forward. Only vaguely recognizing the energy as mana, Miki could only hope that it really wasn't Naruto over there. However, her other best friend beside her made her momentarily lose all focus on that line of thought with what he said to the situation. This power. This isn't chakra, it's magic. Mickey all but whirled around at literally lightning speed, her mind screeching to a halt. W what did you just say? Back with Naruto and Yuko, the latter was blown completely off her feet and sent flying into a tree hard enough to smash right through it, getting a yell of pain out of her. The cause behind this was twofold. The first part was the sheer suddenness and intensity of the explosion of mana from Naruto. The second reason why she was knocked back like that was due to a new figure that had materialized by Naruto's side. Master, are you alright? Asked the new arrival. Naruto could only stand there equally as shocked as Yuko. This voice clearly belonged to a girl, roughly around his age. And something about it just resonated with him. Indeed as he turned to look at who was now standing beside, Naruto laid eyes upon a girl of average height, but with a bit more than modest figure covered up by the strange robe she wore which was white in the front with gold markings on it while it was black in the back. The girl had long light blonde hair tied into two long twin tails, with flower-shaped bows holding them in place. Some of her hair also framed her beautiful and exuberant face, bringing attention to her eyes, her eyes is as captivating as the petals of a sakura tree. The girl smiled gently at Naruto. You're alright, she said, motioning towards Naruto's right thigh and left shoulder, which now sported no wounds. 
I'm glad I made it in time, she said. But Naruto wasn't too focused on what she was saying, only just barely registering the words. Instead, all he could focus on right now was the fact that the girl just seemed impossibly familiar to him. He then shook his head as he found himself just somehow knowing her name. Hinako. The girl Hinako widened her eyes ever so slightly in surprise, but then she smiled once more, laughing lightly. Yes. My name is Hinako and I am the magical weapon and beautiful girl you called forth, master. Naruto could only stare. As for Yuko, her eyebrows nearly shot up into her hairline as she stood up, her movement drawing the attention of both Naruto and Hinako. So you awakened your magical weapon. She had muttered this under her breath, far too low for anyone to hear without using chakra to enhance their hearing, but Naruto, to his surprise, heard it all the same as if she had been saying it a bit louder than a normal voice. Indeed, he found himself much more aware of everything around. Sight, hearing, smell, all of his senses felt much sharper than before, enhanced. A magical weapon Naruto now muttered, his mind having a hard time taking this in. It had been but a few minutes since Yuko first began to speak of such a thing, but right now he was in too much confusion over it all. This strange dimension, Yuko's surprising strength and odd weapons, and now this Hanako girl standing beside him. Hanako blinked once in surprise, but then narrowed her eyes, her facial expression changing from the gentle one she just had to one of surprising and even unusual focus. Master, please stay behind me for now. You're not used to fighting other Magi just yet, and you awakening as a Magus just now will leave you feeling a bit off for a while until you fully adapt to the changes. Naruto, her master as she apparently called him, could only dumbly take a few steps back. Wah. How, he softly said. Anako smiled at him gently. Don't worry master, I'll protect you. Because I am your strongest sword and invincible shield. Then she faced Yuko, who immediately tensed up and with good reason, just as Naruto awoke a moment ago, Hanako had materialized and quickly fired a pink beam of pure magical energy that had completely overpowered her own attack before it could even hit Naruto. The beam in turn had barely missed her, which is what had caused her to go flying back like she did. Erg. With just a thought, the spinning blades that made up overload took point just above Yuko's shoulders and started spinning rapidly. An instant later, the blades glowed and suddenly began to fire magical beams at Naruto. However, Hinako effortlessly moved in front of her master and intercepted the beams with her very own, her beams cancelling out Yuko's with little trouble. Yuko's eyes widened as she once again came to quickly realize that the difference in power was too much, and so she decided to play this a bit more defensively, jumping around with surprising speed from one spot to another, having just one of her blades randomly shoot a magical blast whenever she came to a stop. But Hinako kept up with the attacks, cancelling them out with her own, without taking any more than two steps from her spot in front of Naruto. Wo Naruto muttered breathlessly. He was speechless. Though his mind was still trying to catch up with the strange changes he could literally feel going on with his body right now, he was still of a sound enough mind to pick up on the differences in this battle. Before, when Yuko had been attempting to kill him, he had been forced completely on the defensive, sticking to evasion the whole time until the end, which had come for him pretty quick. It had been due to this supposed magic that Yuko possessed, letting her keep up with him from a physical point of view, in addition to having the long-range advantage. And lastly, those esoteric abilities of her blades had been the final advantage she had had over him, despite him clearly having much more training and battle experience than she did. But now, the tables had been completely turned. Hinako, his magical weapon from what she said, had Yuko on the ropes right now, the long-range advantage that she had held completely negated, thanks to Hinako countering with her own blasts. What's more, now that Yuko was jumping around, Naruto could only once again note that while the red-eyed girl was skilled to an extent, she was definitely lacking in real battle experience, as she looked a bit uncertain on how to dodge Hinako's increasingly accurate blasts. A trained combatant such as a shinobi would be dodging Hinako's blasts on all but instinct due to how much he or she had trained and how many battles he or she would have been in prior to this. In Yuko's case, the girl still had to take a millisecond to think out what to do before actually doing it. And it was this last thing that ultimately led to Yuko being unable to dodge any longer. Hanako took exactly one step to her left, both of her hands thrust out and merely overlapping one another. Mana gathered very quickly in her open hands and shot out a beam considerably stronger than previous ones. Yuko all but practically walked right into the beam, Hanako having predicted perfectly where the red-eyed girl had been about to jump next. All Yuko could do before the beam hit her was seemingly direct her blades out of the way. Aya. She cried out as the beam, thin as it was powerful, struck her right in the gut. It lifted her right off of her feet and blasted her backwards into the forest, knocking down more than dozen trees. The blades followed her awkwardly, though whether it was because it was an automatic thing or if Yuko herself had called them to her was something that Naruto couldn't ascertain at the moment. 
For a brief second, following Hinako's attack, Naruto believed that perhaps Yuko had been taken down, but only to be proven wrong when he heard her moaning in pain immediately after that. Then, a few seconds later, he saw Yuko slowly stand up, coughing up a bit of blood. A nasty wound was visible on her stomach, Hinako's beam having almost gone straight through her. Yuko put a hand to the wound, grimacing as she did this and stared at the inflictor of it, with much wariness in her eyes. Hinako simply returned Yuko's gaze with her own impassive one, her body just tense to continue battling if the red-eyed girl so much as flinched funny. Yuko grunted. Then she began to turn away. Hinako immediately knew what she was about to do. Ha! She let out a bit of a battle cry as she fired off a fast magical beam at Yuko. But Yuko had managed to be quicker on the ball this time and appeared to avoid it, letting the beam strike the ground with great force and cause an explosion. Both Hinako and Naruto had to cover their eyes for a brief second to avoid having any of the dirt blinding them. When all of the dirt and rubble was done flying around, both of them looked to see that Yuko was gone, already out of range of their sight and hearing. The red-eyed girl had escaped. Hinako narrowed her eyes though, keeping herself alert in case of any other attack. That is, until Naruto got her attention. She's gone, he calmly stated. Considering that this appears to be the first time Yuko had faced anyone that far outperformed her in everything, Naruto would bet money that she had fled to somewhere very far away to recuperate and plan out what to do next. It'd be the smart thing for her to do. Naruto just stared at Hanako, who now turned around and had dropped her focused stance. Just what are you? He asked, still confused about all of this. Eh ha ha ha. Hanako began to rub the back of her sheepishly, her eyes closed and a big smile on her face. This very much relaxed look of hers was a far cry from the calm and very focused one she just had. Didn't you pay attention to what I was saying I'm your magical weapon, master? She exclaimed, sounding a bit happy. Naruto couldn't suppress the twitch of his right eyebrow. All of a sudden, Hanako's attitude somewhat reminded him of his sister. He tried, but failed to keep a sigh from escaping his lips. This is gonna take a while, he thought tiredly, his body still feeling a tad bit odd. But the sooner he got Hinako here to fully explain to him what's going on, the better. However, before he could speak, someone else did that wasn't Hinako. Well that's a shame, I would've thought that hot girl would fight on a bit longer. The voice sounded male. Immediately, Naruto and Hinako switched gears, taking up a fighting stance, as they tried to pinpoint where the voice had come from. But before they could truly start to do that, two strange objects suddenly appeared around them and started to circle them at blinding speeds. What? Naruto cried out as he found himself unable to make out the shape of the objects or what they were doing. Master. Hinako cried out as she moved closer to him in case of an attack to his person. The unidentified object spun around them faster and faster, causing a small whirlwind to form, dragging up part of the ground. With Naruto and Hinako still in the center. Then a very brief flash of light occurred and Naruto and Hinako were gone. No. Miki cried out as she and Ryuchi made it onto the scene a nanosecond too late. This is bad, Ryuchi said, observing the impromptu battlefield. Looked like there was one other Magus here. Back when the two of them had stopped earlier, it turned out, much to Mickey's surprise that Ryuchi had awakened as a Magus as well at some point in the past. Flashback start. W what did you just say Mickey had yelled at Ryuchi. Ryuchi nearly jumped, startled by her sudden cry. Yeah. He began. What do you mean? Mickey all but glared at him, stomping the ground. What you just said right now about magic. Ariuchi appeared to try and think of something. But under his friend's gaze, he couldn't exactly hold out too long. Magic exists, he said bluntly. He averted his eyes from Mickey. I know this. Because I can use magic. I'm what you'd call a dot. Amagus. Mickey whispered under her breath. Though she knew the second eye space was activated that Ryuchi was one, to hear him begin to confirm it only made it much worse, crushing the little, far-fetched hope she had about him just accidentally being dragged into eye space with her. Now it was Ryuchi's turn to gaze at her in shock. How do you know about that word? He questioned. Mickey let her head and shoulders drop, looking at the ground. I. It was around that time that Hinako had started to fight against Yuko, though the two of them didn't know this. All they could make out from the battlefield were the sounds of explosions. Both of them looked up in shock and worry in the direction of the fighting. I Mickey straightened her posture. I'll explain it all later. Right now, we have to hurry though. Ryuchi blinked, but then nodded firmly. All right. I'll hold you to that. His friend returned his statement with a nod of her own now, and both of them then turned and took off running again, moving much faster than they were before, now that there was no longer any reason to hide their mega status any longer. But even with their great speed, the battlefield was still very far away. They could only hope to make it in time. Flashback end. Ryuchi smashed his right fist into his open left hand. Damn it and we just barely missed them too. 
Mickey looked around, her worry for Naruto only growing as it dawned on her just how concentrated all of the damage to the battlefield was. If Naruto had taken any of these hits head on, then regardless if he had awakened or not, regardless of his healing factor, he was going to be in bad shape. We can't give up just yet, Mickey stated resolutely. It looked like Naruto and that other girl. Whoever she was, were teleported somewhere. Her male friend nodded in agreement. You're right. As long as it wasn't a long distance teleportation, then they should still be within some distance of this area. Let's do a sweep of this place. But not another word spoken, both immediately moved. They had a lot of ground to cover, after all. But take Haiko and Katsu, the former couldn't help but sigh, almost out of relief. This was not unnoticed by Katsu. What's wrong? Is that blonde-haired boy an unknown factor in this? He questioned. He recalled Takehiko telling him some time ago that when Ice Space was activated, the blonde-haired teen would be left in the real world, while Yuko would be dragged into Ice Space. But clearly, this was not the case. Takehiko didn't answer him. That was just impossible, he thought. He had known that Naruto was a Magi that had yet to awaken prior to just now, but he wasn't meant to be a participant in Ragnarok at all. So for him to be drawn into Ice Space alongside Yuko was quite the shocker. But what's more was that he had awakened and the sheer amount of mana he had exuded. It was far greater than any other Magus he had encountered. Heikaiko hissed. At least Daisuk showed up. It was this thought that put the boy a bit more at ease. Now he just has to eliminate this irregular before he can potentially change the tide of this game. He felt it was a good thing he had bothered at all to make an alliance with Daisuk, his magical weapon would do a good job at ridding him of this potential headache in the making. Now he just had to make sure Daisuk did his part of the deal. Back with Naruto and Hinako, the two of them blinked in shock as they found themselves just several yards above ground. Both of them landed smoothly enough, with Hinako taking just a split second to brush off any dirt on her robes. The two of them quickly looked around to see that they were now in an area closer to the mountain range, being in a large clearing alongside a path that led deep into said mountain range. How did we? Naruto began to think, keeping his guard up in case of a sudden attack. Why oh, the male voice from before said. Naruto and Hinako quickly whirled around on the spot to see a new arrival onto the scene. It was the young man known as Daisuke, not that they knew this. Daisuke sighed as he walked towards them. Then, when he was roughly 10 yards away from them, he stopped, partially because he felt like it, and partially because the two looked ready to attack him if he kept on approaching. Daisuke's seemingly permanent smile curled upwards a bit more. Never would have imagined that the son of a cage would be a magus, he commented. Naruto narrowed his eyes. How do you know about me being the child of a cage? He questioned. It was bad enough having to deal with all of this magical stuff. Daisu chuckled. Ah, it's all thanks to Take Yan. He can find things out about and keep track of just about anyone from the looks of it. Then he paused. But that's probably something I shouldn't have mentioned. Master. Get ready. Hanako yelled as suddenly, more than a dozen strange metallic orbs appeared, surrounding all three of them. Crap, not this again, Naruto thought, already getting a bad feeling about this. Daisuke, for the first time in what he felt was a long time, opened up an eye, albeit only a little to reveal a grey eye. Like the beauty said, Nami Yan, get ready. Because, here. I come. Naruto and Hinako both leapt out of the way as five of the metallic orbs that Daisuke summoned shot at them. Fast, was the only word that went through Naruto's mind as he dodged, but only barely. Hinako, for her part, simply placed her hands together in mid-dodge and fired a magical blast at Daisuke, but the young man ducked and the attack missed him by inches. She would have fired off another blast had it not been for the rest of the orbs proceeding to surround her and Naruto, obscuring her aim. Um, Hinako pondered. These orbs are definitely his magical weapon, but I don't know what would happen if I shot one. She said aloud. Oh. Daisu looked at her with an eyebrow raised in amusement. Pretty astute. One by one, the orbs randomly shot out at the duo, forcing them to continually dodge them all. One of the orbs nearly hit Naruto, but he pulled a Kawarimi with a nearby log, just in time to see the log get utterly smashed. Damn, those things hit hard, he thought. Out of the corner of his eyes, he spotted Hanako several yards to his left, the girl dodging the orb still, while also apparently trying to find some kind of opening to attack. Crap, these orbs seem to be able to move on their own or something if they can so randomly launch themselves at us like this, he began to think as he jumped over one orb before twisting in mid-air to narrowly dodge the next one that came at him from behind. As he landed, he saw the Daisuke watch them both, a smile still on his face. Naruto growled. He doesn't even have to do anything, sooner or later these orbs of his will tire us out and hit us. And that strange thing from earlier. He thought back to how he and Hanako suddenly ended up here. 
It was like my old man's Hiroshin Jutsu, so getting surrounded by even two of these things his thoughts trailed off, and Naruto did his best to not shiver, as a number of ways that these orbs could be utilized came to mind. Sking, Naruto rolled out of the way of three orbs that had nearly blitzed him and quickly moved towards Hinako. He took note of the fact that his body felt faster, stronger. He was beginning to fully adapt to the changes his awakening as Amagus was causing, though he didn't know this particular fact. But he certainly wasn't complaining, already his enhanced senses were kicking, which helped him greatly in leaping over the next two orbs that tried to hit him. He landed right near Hinako, who had finally gone out of her way to blast one of the orbs. Naruto was forced to abruptly cover his eyes to avoid the explosion blinding him, but when it died down a millisecond later and he looked, the orb had withstood the attack, albeit it was quite damaged with several deep cracks on it. Looks like I need to increase the power of my blasts a bit more. Hinako muttered, so low that only Naruto was able to hear her due to him being so close by. Boy, Hinako, Naruto spoke up as suddenly all of the orbs stopped attacking and took to moving up into the sky in a circular formation. Undoubtedly, it was nothing more than a simple setup to something grander. Yes master, she replied as her eyes followed the orbs. All this stuff about magic and all is there anything about it to defeat one who uses it? He questioned quickly. Boy, Nami and Daisuke spoke up. He began to take a few steps forward. What are you two talking about? Naruto ignored him and instead focused on Hinako and the orbs that had now stopped moving up above them. Well. This dimension. If my suspicions about it are right, then we probably have to destroy his magical weapon the orbs above us, Hinako replied as she placed her hands together and began to slowly charge up two separate magical blasts. The son of the Hokage gritted his teeth. Great. Somehow I doubt it'll be easy. Anything you can do that might work. Hinako opened her mouth to reply, but alas, she didn't get a chance to say anything when all of the orbs shot down from the skies like comets. The two of them were forced to jump away from each other as two orbs hit the ground where they had been. It was at this point that the two magical blasts Hinako had been charging up were released by the humanoid magical weapon, with one being aimed at an incoming orb while the other was aimed at Daisuke, who had been calmly approaching them. The blast that struck the orb was considerably stronger than the previous one and thus it succeeded in shattering the orb entirely. However, it was very much to Hinako's and Naruto's surprise when they saw it reform from the dust that it had just been reduced to. What? Hinako exclaimed, jumping back to avoid the reformed orb as it continued its original path. As for the magical blast aimed at Daisuke, the man jumped out of the way and moved to his right. Whoa now, that was Klo, he began only to be cut off when suddenly he saw Naruto right in front of him. Huh. Naruto had taken advantage of the magical blast to move in on him. And it was now without so much as a battle cry that he swung a fist at Daisuke. The young man tilted his head at the last possible second, his nose nearly being grazed by the hit. Naruto's eyes narrowed but otherwise showed no other emotion as he then began to unleash a rapid assault of punches and kicks. Daisuke dodged each and every hit but not without effort, the young man breaking out into a slight sweat. Whoa there, nami Yan, you're pretty good. He exclaimed despite this as he then lightly stepped back before spotting an opening and throwing a punch of his own. But Naruto had actually intended for this opening to happen and so when the punch came, he immediately deflected it aside before kicking upwards, trying to hit Daisuke in the chin. Desu reared his head back to avoid it, but unlike the previous attacks, this one grazed him slightly, and it packed enough power behind it to send Desu flying back several meters. Uig. He cried out, tumbling across the ground. Damn, Naruto thought. Though the hit connected, already he could see Desu begin to recover from it. Granted, he hadn't be attacking at full speed or strength just yet, but for the perpetual smiler to avoid most of his attacks like that and with such experienced movements, showed Naruto that Daisuke was considerably more experienced than Yuko when it came to battle. What's more, his body still felt like it was adapting to whatever was happening to him, Naruto being able to still feel his physical abilities increasing little by little, but he doubted it'd do much good against his current foe. Oh ho, that was a good one there, nami Yan, Daisuke commented as he began to stand. There was a bit of blood flowing from a small wound on his lip, but he wiped it away and gave Naruto a good view of the wound, promptly closing up and fading away, leaving the son of the Hokage to stare with widened eyes. You pack a mean kick. But it'll take more than that to stop me. He charged at Naruto, keeping low to the ground. Naruto skipped forward a few steps to meet him halfway and stomped downwards. But Daisuke stopped his charge right before that and seemed to somersault forward, his feet aiming for Naruto's face. But Naruto was having none of that, he remembered Ryuchi doing something like this a long time ago, and so he was ready for it. He reached out and grabbed Daisuke's feet. Rog. He let out a bit of a growl as he then lifted Daisuke up and did a modified shoulder toss, flinging his opponent into the sky. 
Naruto would have followed up the toss with some shuriken if he had his pack on hand, but since he didn't, all he could do was simply jump into the air after him. The blonde didn't get very far when suddenly an orb moved away from Hinako, who was still fending them off, and slammed right into Naruto's side. Crying out in equal part surprise and pain, the recently awakened Magus went crashing into the ground, the orb still all but burying itself in between his ribs. You didn't think it'd just be a fistfight between you and me, right? Daisuke said as he flipped around in midair and proceeded to safely land. Uh. It was a nice hope, Naruto retorted. As he began to stand, he reached out a hand to grab the orb still smashing into his side, but right before he could do so, it suddenly backed away and circled around him. It was also joined by yet another orb. Why he couldn't even finish the word when a brief flash of light enveloped him, and the next thing he found himself looking at was the ground from several hundred yards up in the air. OCR, he began to say before he began to fall. Master? Hinako cried out. She narrowed her eyes as she then moved out of the flight path of the orbs, still attempting to hit her, and took aim at Daisuke. Immediately, she fired more than ten magical blasts in rapid succession. Huh? For the first time, Daisuke's smile seemed to disappear a bit as he took note of the sudden incoming attacks. He then mentally commanded the two orbs that had surrounded Naruto just now to move in front of him to serve as a shield. However, the first magical blast blew right through them as if they weren't even there. Uh-oh. Daisuke's eyes opened wide as he saw that his orbs weren't tough enough to withstand the attack, and so he took to evading the magical blasts, while silently ordering the two reformed orbs to move away. He managed to dodge most of the blasts, but the last two hit him, one striking his shoulder, while the other, a thin blast, pierced him through the side of his stomach and kept on moving onwards. Arg. He cried out before the blast that had pierced through his stomach exploded after passing a few yards behind him, exploding with enough force to blow up an entire building. He went flying forward, in too much sudden pain to think, and it was during this time that the orbs that had been attacking Hinako so relentlessly just moments ago lost some speed, while some of them even stopped moving and floated in the air. Master? Hinako yelled out, taking advantage of this to see Naruto about to crash. But before she could do anything, she saw him flip in mid-air and proceed to land on his feet. When he did, the momentum of his fall created a bit of a shockwave, blowing dirt all over the place and forcing Hinako to not approach any closer at the moment. But despite the height he fell from, as Naruto stood a little shakily to his feet, he wasn't hurt. Whoa, he muttered. That was a bit too close. Anako sighed in relief. Master, she began, his magical weapon's ability, I think it's dot she was cut off by Naruto, who nodded his head suddenly. Yeah. It's different from my old man's Hiroshin, but that was definitely teleportation. Naruto looked at Daisuke, who was beginning to stand up, pain evident on his face. Am I right? Aesu chuckled, only to suddenly stop and grimace right after, the chuckling hurting him. Pretty sharp there, Nami Yan. As he stood to his feet, Naruto noted that the wound in his stomach had already stopped bleeding. Daisu coughed. Yeah, that's right. That's more or less how my magical weapon, Field Changer, works. Naruto subtly shifted his position a bit in case of an attack. Ha, huh, he thought, the pain in my side is already gone. He briefly checked his side and found not so much as a bruise. Looks like his minor healing ability from the Uzumaki side of his family had been boosted as well. He focused on Daisuke again. Nice of you confirm it, he said sharply. Now, moving on, just what the hell is going on? Daisuke's smile faltered a bit. To his side, Naruto could almost literally feel Hanako ready herself to attack as this happened. Ragnarok, Daisuke simply said it first, a ritual of sorts. And here in this place, we Magi have to fight each other. Naruto and Hinako both blinked in surprise when their foe suddenly opened his eyes fully, his grey eyes filled with a number of different emotions. His smile had even turned a bit bitter. And we can't return back to the real world until Lamagi is defeated by destroying their magical weapon, Nami Yan. That's what you're a part of right now. Be but how? Naruto questioned. He was so taken aback by what he just heard that he actually dropped his battle stance for a moment. How is this even possible? What the hell is this ritual or whatever for? And why am I even a part of it? He was beginning to sound more and more confused and irate with every sentence. Aesu chuckled. How this is exactly possible and what it's exactly for, I can't really tell you, since I don't know either. He then gained a serious expression to his face for the first time thus far. But I can tell you this much. There are others involved in this ritual than just the two of us. Thirteen, including ourselves, I think. And we have to fight one another until only one is left standing, and that person can gain enough power to achieve something that they've always wanted. He trailed off, appearing to be deep in thought. Wah. Naruto could only stare at the young man, not knowing what to say to this. Master, Hinako spoke up quietly from beside him. Get ready, I feel that he's about to attack us again. 
as if to confirm this, all of the orbs that made up Field Changer began to gather above Daisuk. Sorry Nami Yan, he began as he raised his right hand straight up. As he did so, all of the orbs took formation, said formation vaguely resembling that of a lance. All of the orbs began to glow brightly with mana. But I probably should be telling you anything more. As it stands right now, you and your little lady weapon have been holding your own pretty well despite our short scuffle. If I let this go on any longer, there's no telling how tough you'd end up being. Dch. Naruto slowly shifted into a defensive stance while Hanako took a few steps back. However, still feeling way out of his depth here, Naruto wasn't sure just how he'd defend himself from whatever it is that is about to happen. Hanako, he whispered. Yes. She answered. You have any kind of attack in particular that could destroy those things. Naruto whispered to her. Hanako nodded. Yes. She paused as she placed her hands together and began to gather focus her mana. But the shockwave it'll make afterwards. If it can beat him and let us survive, then do it. He retorted. Anako wordlessly began to form a ball of pure mana in her outstretched hands. Naruto could literally feel the power of it and felt it increase with every passing second. Asuk's orbs were doing the same, with the young man still standing where he was. Naruto was tempted to attack him, but he didn't want to risk Asuk launching the attack right at him earlier than expected. The young man seemed to notice this and bitterly smiled. Too cautious to charge at me, huh? He spoke up. Good call. With my field changer, I could hit you with one of the orbs and teleport to wherever I want, just like I did earlier. I could teleport you even higher into the air than before, or maybe send you deep underwater in a lake or something, but you don't have to worry about that, this is going to be my final strike. A nearly blinding flash of light occurred, said flash coming from the orbs. Looks like it's done charging Naruto thought and worry, preparing to try and dodge in case Hanako wasn't done with her own attack. Hanako. He muttered. Almost there, master. I can't exactly move or anything when I'm doing this. Hanako quietly replied, her concentration not breaking even with what was going on before her. Here we go, Nami Yan. Naruto looked at Daisuke, who began to slowly move his raised arm. Just another second or two Hanako quietly said, a bead of sweat on her face now, undoubtedly from a result of how close she was cutting it here. This attack of mine will strike the two of you like a meteor, fast and powerful, Daisuke said, explaining his attack. And Field Changer's teleportation ability will kick in and spread you to atom by atom all across the entire area. No matter how tough you are or how good your healing may be, you and your magical weapon won't be coming back together. Asuk opened his eyes and then thrust his raised arm forth at the duo. Scatter Lance. The orb shot forth on his command, going straight for Naruto and Hinako at a speed that not even a cage could hope to outdo. Erg. Naruto's eyes widened as he instinctively realized that Hanako wasn't going to be able to finish charging her attack in time. And avoiding the attack was all but impossible at this point. If only I could just rewind things for a second. He began to think, before an entirely new feeling quickly washed over him. H here. He continued to think. A strange feeling overcame him completely and as if it was an instinct, Naruto took a step forward and thrust out his right hand towards the incoming orbs and yelled out two words that felt so natural to him. Akapo. They Kaiko and Katsu, who had managed to track the three down and were watching from afar as they did with the previous battle, could only stare in wide eyes at what happened. What? Katsu all but yelled out in shock. As for his young ally, Te Kaiko could only stare, mouth slightly ajar at what happened. An intricate ocean blue runic symbol appeared before Naruto's outstretched hand, glowing brightly as the blonde had yelled out those two words. Immediately after this had happened, the orbs, which had been just about to strike Naruto and Hinako, suddenly disappeared and reappeared above Daisuk, though they were still in motion. Daisuk himself was just as stunned. W what? Though the orbs still shot forth at the two, whatever had happened had done its part. Hinako. Naruto yelled. Yes. Hinako had finally finished charging her own attack, and so it was in that instant that she took aim at the incoming orbs, and now launched her attack. Levitane. A massive blast of purely concentrate mana shot forth from her hands at a speed that far surpassed all of her previous magical blasts combined. Moving at nearly the speed of light, Hinako's magical blast connected with Daisuke's orbs. The orbs, field changer, stood no chance whatsoever. Immediately, the orbs were enveloped by the blast and destroyed, completely and utterly. That was when the blast finally exploded afterwards. From their watching spots, both Takehiko and Katsu were nearly knocked off of their feet, and they had to cover their eyes as they became witnesses to an absolutely massive explosion. Elsewhere, both Ryuchi and Miki stopped their search when they were blown back from the shockwave of the explosion. As the two of them landed ungracefully on the ground, they looked in the direction it had come from, and their breath hitched as they saw said explosion, coming from a more mountainous area, the area where Naruto, Hinako, and Daisuke were at. 
Naruto. Both of them needed no further confirmation as to where their friend was at. In an instant, Ryuchi and Miki took off, running at full speed. As for Naruto and Hinako, both of them too were thrown off by the explosion of the latter's attack. However, it appeared that Hinako wasn't affected too much as she simply took a few steps back, whereas Naruto, who hadn't been expecting such power, was blown back a dozen meters. Master, are you alright? Hinako asked with a voice full of concern. W O was all Naruto could say as he stared wide-eyed at the sight before him. Hinako had aimed her attack, Levitane, upwards at the now-destroyed orbs, yet the explosion had been so massive that the area before them had been utterly decimated, with virtually nothing left standing at all. Hinoha would have been wiped out three times over if it was hit with something like that he thought, amazed by the power of Hinako's attack. Urg. Naruto immediately stood to his feet and Hinako tensed up. As the dust and flying debris ceased to be, both of them saw Daisuk, still in one piece, though rather wounded, with a number of bruises and cuts all over his now exposed upper body, his shirt having been destroyed by the mere shockwave of the explosion. Still alive, huh? Naruto muttered, but immediately retracted his words when he saw yet another mysterious thing today. Slowly but surely, Daisuk's body appeared to become a bit more transparent. He even appeared to be almost actually fading away into nothingness. With his magical weapon now destroyed, he's fading away into nothingness, Hinako explained, answering Naruto's unspoken question. A look of sadness appeared on her face as she spoke this. She even went as far to relax her body, no longer in any mood to fight. And no. Daisuke muttered. He was on knees and despite his disappearing body, he tried to stand up. Any and all forms of playfulness he had earlier were now completely gone. Now, as he slowly stood, he gazed at Naruto with open eyes, determination blazing in them. I know I messed up by screwing around. But I can't disappear like this. He took a few steps forward. His body continued to fade away. The only reason why he was lasting this long at all was now due to his own willpower. I have to survive this. Cause if I don't. My Obasan. He said slowly. Naruto could only stare at him, his expression unreadable. He wasn't quite sure why, but he couldn't help but feel sorry for the guy. What about her? He asked, his voice calm. My parents died a long time ago. A and she and I have no other relatives, Daisuke began as he continued walking towards Naruto. For as long as I can recall, Obasan has always been in poor physical health, and the little village we live in. Isn't all that rich so the medical treatment isn't great. He paused slightly, panting now. And the only medical treatment that is good is costly. So I have to try and cover for it, but it's just too damn much to pay for. Naruto's eyes narrowed slightly out of something akin to sympathy and sadness. Daisuke was clearly dying, that much he knew, and he could tell that the young man was speaking from the heart. I'm all she has left. And she's all I have left. Daisuke kept on walking, though with every step he now took, he staggered slightly. So I, I have to win this damn thing. I have to be the winner of Ragnarok with the power I'd obtain as the winner, I see can help her, without having to worry any longer about treatment. At this point, Daisuke had finally come within arm's length of Naruto. Neither Naruto or Hanako said or did anything. They didn't even bother to take up any kind of battle stance. Instead, Naruto simply stood there, his blue eyes firmly focused on Daisuke's gray eyes of determination. Daisuke reared back his right fist weakly and threw a punch at Naruto's chest. The blonde didn't dodge nor block. He just let the punch hit him. It didn't hurt him in the slightest due to how slow and clumsy it was thanks to Daisuke's state. And yet, while it didn't hurt him physically, Naruto couldn't help but slightly take a step back, within that feeble punch, the originally playful Daisuke had bottled up the entirety of his will, and that it passed on to Naruto, showing him just how serious the man was about this. You. Daisuke's legs gave out on him and he slumped to the ground. He still did his best to keep his head raised so that he can continue to look at Naruto. Damn it. Naruto and Hinako looked at the man in silence. Then a few seconds later, Naruto spoke up. What's your name? He asked quietly. Be Daisuke. The dying Magus answered, Nakamura Daisuke. Daisuke San Naruto began, his eyes softening a bit. I am still sort of in shock, I guess. I still don't fully understand what's going. I still don't understand why you or Yuko San had to attack me, or what the hell this place is a slight pause. But right now, that doesn't matter to me. Naruto crouched down a bit so that he and Daisuke were eye level. What does matter to right now is where exactly your village is at. Daisuke quickly blinked. It's a small village. Halfway between Kanoha and Kusagakur if you walk from Kanoha to Kusagakur, you can't really miss it, since it'll be just a bit off to the left of the main path between the two he said tiredly. Naruto nodded slowly. He's been out that way once before, on a mission long ago. Despite the fact that there are very few missions he's been on out that way, he was certain he could find the village if he looked the next time he was there. 
The next time I'm on a mission out that way, I'll stop by your village, try and give your Obasan a hand, he said. Asuk's eyes widened in shock. Then he chuckled. The way you speak you're really telling the truth there, Nami Yan. He chuckled again. Despite me trying to kill you. You're a strange one. Naruto smiled slowly. I guess I am a bit odd. Asuk nodded tiredly. He was silent for several seconds, looking down at the ground before looking back at Naruto. If or when you go there. Stop at the house with a small shrine right next to the doorway. And maybe bring a few peaches with you, Obasan has a thing for peaches. Naruto nodded. I will. Asuk smiled peacefully. Then, with his will to continue on now gone, he finished fading away. Master. Hinako quietly said from her spot next to Naruto. Naruto didn't respond to her, though he did slowly raise his head in surprise when a strange glowing occurred and eye space disappeared, returning them to the real world. Huh, it really was an entirely different dimension. He muttered, noticing that all of the destruction caused to the environment in eye space didn't carry over to the real world. Naruto. Both the aforementioned blonde and Hinako blinked in surprise and turned around in time to see Ryuchi and Miki coming towards them through the thick forest. Ah. Naruto smiled tiredly several seconds later as his two closest friends exited the forest and were now about to reach him. Hey there gee guys he trailed off as he then lost consciousness. Master. Hinako shouted as she reached out to grab him before he could slump to the ground. No Naruto. Ryuchi shouted, with Miki looking horrified as they approached. Miki hoped that he hadn't lost, what with eye space gone now. From their observation point, both Takehiko and Katsu watched as Ryuchi and Miki all but ignored Hinako and tended to their friend. However, Katsu's attention was a bit more focused on the young boy. It would seem that what had happened was completely unexpected by him, he thought as he calmly eyed Takehiko. So however it is that he keeps track of us, it doesn't seem to be perfect. Then he looked at Naruto and Hinako. But moreover, that boy. For his magical weapon to be humanoid and to have such power. He brought his thoughts to a halt then and there, knowing himself well enough to know that if he continued this line of thought, he'd most likely try something rash. And that was something he couldn't afford. For the sake of achieving his wish, he simply can't afford to do anything even remotely reckless. As for Takehiko, the boy was eyeballing the son of the Hokage and his humanoid magical weapon. TCH. He was a bit amazed that Naruto had managed to triumph over Daisuk. he had a surprising deal of faith in the now defeated Magus, so the fact that Naruto had won in relatively short order made him stand a bit on edge right now. I think an irregular would show up in Ragnarok and already cause things to shift. He thought. He then snorted. Ultimately, irregular or not, Naruto would not matter much in the end. For he was the king and as such, losing to anyone was simply impermissible. So if the irregular doesn't fall to the hands of another Ragnarok participant, then he will most definitely fall to him if they ever fought. Let's go, he said to Katsu, turning his back on the side of Naruto now about to be carried back to Konoha by Ryuchi and Miki, Hanako getting ready to follow the three. Oh. And what of them? Or the other participants? Katsu asked with a quirked eyebrow. If you're asking me when I will next activate eye space, even I myself am not sure. It'll ultimately come down to whether or not I feel like being in the mood. Take Heiko paused briefly as he continued walking. At any rate, I will give them all at least a week or two, before even thinking of activating eye space again, keep them in suspense and on edge, try and trip them up. Hatsu nodded slowly. As an experienced shinobi, he could easily see the logic in what Take Heiko was saying. However, he doubted that whatever the young boy had planned would go as he thought. After all, there are plenty of others out there who see themselves as being smart, only to stumble and fall in the end. And should that moment ever come and you try and get rid of me, I will definitely strike you down, boy, he thought. But that in his mind, he followed after Take Heiko in silence, the first day of Ragnarok now over. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.